All right, and we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. We got a great show planned for y'all. We're going to talk about Operation Shattered Shield, the largest corrupt police bust in New Orleans history. It's going to be lit. Let's get into it, baby. It's going to be a good one. Move over, Denzel. Okay, guys, I used to be a special agent on Lynch Investigations. It is. This is the arrest paperwork, okay? So here is the booking uh cases that i did mostly were human smuggling and drug trafficking those are like two crimes that i'm a very good agent very strong agent i did a lot of big cases i've done title three intercepts which is basically listening to phones i've written hundreds of affidavits to arrest people i've done uh i've been a grand jury and testified a million times i've done big cases uh i've done all right, cool. What's up, guys? Welcome to Fed It, man. I'm really excited for today's episode, man. Uh, you guys could be anywhere else, but you're here with us. So uh, I appreciate that greatly, man. And we got a special guest in the house. Um, you want to introduce yourself, Miss Co-host, for, for today's episode? <laughs> Hi, I'm Jay. You have anything else you want to tell the people? Um, no. That's it? I, I don't know what I'm doing, so I hope it goes well. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> all right, guys. So, yeah, welcome to the show, guys. Today's episode is going to be great. I'm really excited for it. I did a lot of research for this one. Um, we haven't done a public corruption case yet on this. Um, well, actually, no, I told you guys about that time I arrested Border Patrol agent for being a, a pedo. But this is like real corruption, like misusing your authority type corruption. Corruption. So um, this case, guys, is a case from the 90s. We're actually going to break down Two different documentaries that talk about this investigation. So I appreciate that, um, that you guys are here with us. So let me see here with the Super Chats. Can we start highlighting some of them here? We got, okay, so five-star sports betting, uh, bruh. Yeah, I appreciate it, my friend. Uh, and sorry for the delay, guys. We had a Zoom call right before this one. So, and then we got five-star sports betting goes, Myron, have you ever been shot at or even hit? Was there ever a time I might not make it home tonight? Cross your mind in the line of work? Uh, I've been in some pretty dangerous situations, I'm not going to lie. But uh, never been shot at, never been hit. So that's good. But there were times where, like, we were doing, you know, very high risk warrants, and I was like, oh shit, well this this is this is very dangerous. But I got to a point where, um, so when I was on a job, guys, I was like, my primary focus was being the case agent, and the case agent guy is the person that controls the investigation. They're the one dealing with the U.S. Attorney's Office. They're the one writing the affidavits. They're the ones that are um, running the case. Like they're managing the case. So. When you're the case agent and you're doing all this stuff, you don't have time to like sit there and like, you know, do surveillance on on guys before you're going to arrest them all other shit. So a lot of times when I had high risk arrest warrants, I would either delegate it to our SWAT team or I would give the warrant over to the marshals and they would go get them for me. So um, that saves a lot of time, bro, because like bet, like we call it betting down somebody down. Whenever you have a warrant for someone or you know you're about to arrest them, you got to watch them for a couple of days to see where they live, you know, see what their pattern of life is so that when you actually hit the house, you know he's going to be there. And that shit is extremely time consuming. So what I would do is I would just give my warrants over to the marshals and they will go get them. And the thing is, is that I had a relationship with the U.S. marshals. They were I was uh, friends with one of them on the Mexican border. So they would do their little roundups like once a week. Right. And they will go get the fugitives. When he went and got, he would get my guy purposely last because I used to wake up late <laughs> and uh, and then I would go and meet them at the uh, at the station once he picked them up for me. And then I just go in there and do the interview and he would sit in and everything else like that. So, uh, you know, because I was like very um, if I worked with you, I would share my informants. I would share my information, everything else like that, which is rare. You know, federal law enforcement, everyone wants to kind of work for themselves. And, you know, this is my informant and I'm not sharing information or whatever. But like if I worked with you, I was always very forthcoming with my investigation. So like, and marshals don't really do complex investigations like that. So when you bring them into something like that, that's like a big, sexy case, they're going to go above and beyond to help you. So I always used to do that. He would go get my guys for me. He'd go in there with a SWAT team, pick them up, blah, blah, blah. And then I would just show up, do my interview, everything else like that, because you don't have time to bed your guys down, your targets down when you're actually doing big cases, which this case we're about to break down was huge, which we're going to talk about that. Um, and I'm going to give you guys some insight as well, because I've done investigations very similar to this as well. Um, okay, and then what do we got here? Anything? Uh, we got nine, um, 12 pack of Modelos. Was that Chris Mugshot? Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, that's actually Len Davis, guys, who was one of the main corrupt police officers in this investigation, which we're going to get into. Uh, and then we got Nigel Saps, 20 bucks. You should have done the Baltimore Gun Trace Task Force. That's some serious public corruption. Don't worry, I'm already ahead of you, my friend. I watched that um, that HBO special, We Run This City, and I already have the documents for it. So I'm already a step ahead of you, my friend, but uh, good catch there. Um, we're going to definitely break that one down, too. 
Uh, let's see here. And then we got uh, Chris Clayton, five bucks. Thank you so much. And then we got Nate Draco. That intro music makes you want to be <laughs> makes you want to be a hype man. Thank you very much. I appreciate. It. I'm gonna redo that that intro. Uh, Kaizen Graphics, if you're in here, bro, let me know because I definitely want to redo that intro. I think we can make it better. Um, as you guys know, we're always trying to improve the quality of the show. All right, cool. So um, I got my notes here. Uh, I took a lot of notes for this one. I'm really excited to share this case with you guys. We're going to be breaking down two different documentaries. Uh, one is from Vice. The other one is from the FBI files. Um, and the one from the FBI files, I think, is better because it's a little bit more detailed. But we're going to be flip-flopping between the two and breaking down different aspects of the case because, you know, there's portions of the Vice documentary that shows things that I think are very important and relevant that you guys can learn from. And then there's also parts from the original documentary that I think you guys are going to be able to learn from as well. So uh, before we get this thing going, there's already 500 of you guys in here. So please like the video, man. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, because there's no one else on YouTube that is a former special agent of Homeland Security or any federal agency for that matter that breaks down these cases to the degree that I do. I know there's a lot of lawyers on YouTube that break down cases, but they can't really tell y'all how these investigations are done from an investigator standpoint, because a prosecutor and an investigator are two completely different things. So cool. Uh, you have anything you want to tell the people, Jay, before I get into this bad boy? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. All right, cool. Um, and she's involved in the legal world as well, guys, so she's going to uh, know some of the uh, concepts and everything else like that that we're going to be talking about. Um, cool. So we're going to start, guys, by reacting to this um, documentary. I'm going to be stopping it periodically to talk about certain things, give you guys a little bit more info, um, but this is from the FBI files, guys. So uh, let's go ahead and start breaking this bad boy down now. I'm going to share a screen with y'all. Okay. Russian narcotics. The drug lords have all the power, even over the police. Corruption in New Orleans grew like cancer, eating away at public safety and threatening to destroy the city. Lured by easy wealth, crooked cops began breaking the laws they were sworn to uphold. I'm Jim Kallstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. When it became clear that the police could no longer police themselves, the FBI had to get involved. It was a case where the line between friends and enemies became dangerously blurred. So just so you guys know, um, the FBI is the primary agency that investigates public corruption in the United States. OK, the Federal Bureau of Investigation under the Department of U.S. Justice um, and now, do other agencies also investigate public corruption to a degree? Yes, but the uh, FBI lead agency when it comes to public corruption. So when it's uh, when we're talking about arresting dirty police officers, um, dirty agents, dirty um, dirty government employees, uh, you know, people that are involved in espionage, like you know your boy Ed uh, Snowden, right? He went ahead and leaked secrets, and he was a uh, he was had an NSA clearance and SCIA clearance. Um, so when it comes to any type of public corruption, mayors, governors, whatever it may be, the FBI typically takes the lead on these types of investigations, okay? New Orleans, 1993. Now, New Orleans in 1993, guys, was a different world. And I'm going to show, uh, show you guys that here um, right now. This is what, was go what New Orleans was like in 1993. But for some residents, there's a dark side to this tourist hotspot. And tonight, the problem of violent crime is an epidemic in New Orleans. Once again, the Big Easy is headed for a record-setting year for murders. 389 murders. We're four and five times the rate of other cities. Which is insane, guys. Um, you know, I was born in 90, so this is a little bit, you know, <laughs> before my time. But anyone that's older in the chat understands uh, New Orleans was really dangerous at this point in the early 90s. I mean four times the national average in murder. So this is kind of to illustrate for you guys what the atmosphere was like um, back then. When I was around about 13 years old, things began to change in the projects. Crack cocaine had a tremendous impact in the African-American community because these people were already poor. So crack cocaine, guys, is basically cocaine that's, you know, boiled up. And what you're able to do is you're taking able to take the powder-based cocaine, cook it up, spread it much further and it's much cheaper more addictive and potent than regular cocaine okay and this it was very popular obviously it, the, the crack epidemic re, um, went crazy in the 80s and uh it really affected the lower socioeconomic neighborhoods which tended to be uh predominantly african-american so uh you know obviously new orleans is um you know not an exception to that and it would do anything to get it it was crazy 
You know, when crack was introduced, it changed the game. You know, you started seeing, you know, people hanging on the corners, you know, these areas that were really nice areas. Now, some of these areas are really hot areas. But back then, you know, you would see the tennis shoes throw it up on the line. You know, some of these corners becoming what they would say million dollar corners. The reality is that if you're dealing crack, you have to pack a gun. Yes, very, very violent times, guys, um, because every, obviously everyone is fighting to sell the same product. So what it led to indirectly was an armed force of cocaine entrepreneurs. Cocainepreneurs. A city famous for celebrating life. Or crackanoors, I guess, in this case. Even a death has set a record no one can tolerate. At the time, New Orleans was leading the country in the number of homicides. Okay, so Kathy Adams, uh, special, FBI special agent, retired. This woman was one of the case agents on this case, guys. So as I explained before, what is a case agent? Case agent is a person that manages and directs the case. Um, she was the co-case agent in this case. You guys are going to meet the actual case agent here in a second. And his name was, uh, I think, Stan Hatton. And violent crime. So there wasn't a lack of work for law enforcement. It was having to prioritize the resources to address the problems. Okay. So now you guys kind of understand what the atmosphere was like in the early 90s in New Orleans. Tourists packed the city looking for a good time. Not all of it legal. Cocaine was in demand and the dealers cashed in. It was a violent business. For protection, the drug lords turned to those whose duty was to serve and protect. Officers lined their pockets while enforcing the will. How's the sound, by the way, guys? Give me ones in the chat if you guys, uh, if the sound is good. Um, but yeah, this is crazy shit, man. And this was actually going on in New Orleans where they were fucking beating the shit out of the dealers. Or the dealers. They controlled turf like thugs, terrorizing innocent civilians. Agent Stan Hatton of the FBI's Public Corruption Unit in New Orleans. Light echo. Hold on. Let me see if I can get rid of it right now, guys. I want to make sure y'all are good here. Okay. Let me know if it echoes now, guys. Give me ones in the chat. I'm going to play it again. Let me know. This is Stan Hatton, by the way, guys. This is the case agent on the actual case was aware of the growing problem. Our intelligence told us that there was a great variety of corruption uh, taking place among uh, many different officers on the department. However, uh, this the one thing that seemed to be the most... No echoes now? We good? All right, baby. That's what we're talking about. Okay, awesome. Uh, all right, so this is Stan Hatton right here, guys. This was an actual case agent. He was assigned to the public corruption squad uh, for FBI... Um, New Orleans at the time, back in the 90s. Most pervasive was that officers were out there working with drug dealers on the street, were protecting drug dealers on the street, and were stealing money and drugs from drug dealers on the street. One such drug dealer was Terry Adams, known on the streets as Scabu. He was a small time operator who was being extorted by officer Sammy Williams. Okay, so what is extortion, guys? Basically, extortion is uh, a promise of violence against you unless you comply, typically by paying money or some type of other asset to someone that um, that is protecting you or whatever. Now, this was very common with the mafia. You know, they tell businesses, hey, you want to operate here? You want to pay us protection costs? You need to go ahead and pay us, you know, a certain amount of money or whatever it may be, or else your business is going to get fucked up. So this guy was a drug dealer, and he was getting extorted by the police. Now, some of you guys are probably wondering, well, whoa, hold on, wait. Wait, Myra, why the hell were the police extorting drug dealers in the early 90s? Well, guys, there's a couple reasons. Number one, we knew that uh, crack had, was exploding, right? In the United States in the 80s and leaked into the 90s, New Orleans was a very poor city. The murder rates were crazy. And we're also going to show here, which I'm going to pull this up for y'all right now, what was the pay like for police officers back then, guys? And it's actually fucking crazy. It was a very dangerous job. So we're going to play this other clip right here, just so you guys kind of get an insight. And this guy right here is uh, Dees, guys, who was a part of this documentary. He was one of the corrupt police officers that was indicted. Survived the fifth. 
The dangerous work demanded of cops in the district far outweighed the compensation. We didn't get paid a whole lot of money. You know, I don't know. That's one of the cops that was uh, arrested, D's. No, exactly what it was. I don't know if it was $10, $12. Holy! 1993 average incomes. New Orleans Police Department. 16, uh, th what, 1664? Uh, or 16, yeah. Yeah, $16,640,000 per year, it looks like. And then New Orleans, 24000 That was the, as the average. Then the United States average was 26362 I think that's a that's a typo there, um, which is fucking crazy. So let's go ahead and look at how much that was in today's day and age. So $16,640 in 1993 today has the buying power of about thirty two k, which is fucking nothing, guys. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that's barely anything, okay? Compared to United States average and New Orleans. So obviously anytime you have police departments where they're getting paid that little, ripe for corruption. Anytime you guys go through a background check for a law enforcement agency, like for example, when I went through with HSI, they do a very thorough background check. And most police agencies do a thorough background check. And the reason why is because they know when you're not getting when you when you're in debt or you're not getting paid or whatever it may be, you're gonna be more uh susceptible to corruption. So in this case, uh the New Orleans Police Department wasn't making shit. And then on top of that, it was extremely dangerous, okay? Um, and $26,000 back then was the roughly of about $52,000 today, guys. So that kind of puts things in perspective. You know, not giving these guys, uh, you know, out for their corruption, but you can kind of see where they were coming from, right? You made more money committing crimes versus protecting the people against it. Now, the pay wasn't good. Streetcar operators made more than some cops certainly more than entry-level cops at the time. That was one of the prosecutors on the case. It was almost a job of last resort. Okay, so let's, so now you guys know kind of what was going on. We'll go back to the original documentary. So Skabu right here is getting extorted by Sammy Williams, okay? A police officer for the New Orleans Police Department. But this time, the protection money Skabu paid Williams wasn't enough. On Christmas Eve, the officer demanded that Scabu pay him $10,000 cash by 6 p.m. If Scabu failed to show, Williams threatened to beat him and guaranteed him 20 years to life. So he told him, yo, you got to pay 10K up, bro. And the drug dealers can't do nothing. What are they going to do? Go to the police and be like, hey, listen, bro. Uh, you know, I I'm getting extorted. Uh, I know I'm selling drugs and everything, but I'm getting extorted, man. This money is mine. Like, bruh. <laughs> you can't do nothing they can't do shit so this guy takes it upon himself and you're gonna see what he does here next so shout out to my guy at Lattimore in the chat he goes uh they did the same background check for my secret clearance in the army want to make sure i wasn't in debt and would sell secrets absolutely bro they, they, they take that shit very seriously especially now and then we got raul here goes pds do credit checks for this reason this is why we need to pay our officers more keep up the hard work and god bless you Marin. thank you so much my friend i appreciate it hope you guys are enjoying this uh this breakdown so let's keep going that evening, at 5 p.m., Special Agent Stan Haddon was finishing up some last-minute work. About to go home, he took one last call. It was Scabu. His time was running out. He told Haddon that he was being blackmailed, but... If he was at the office at 5 o'clock on a fucking Christmas Eve, I, that's how I could tell this guy was a hard charger, bro. Christmas Eve, you ain't gonna catch no agents in the fucking office, bro. I was like the only guy that, that would be in the office on Christmas Eve or on Christmas Day working. So, um, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And like the video, by the way, guys. So, yeah, this guy, you could already tell. I mean, he, he was the case agent on this thing, so you, I already knew he was a hard worker just from, you know, to put a case together like this, I could only imagine the work that it took. But, uh, yeah, this guy was definitely a hard charger. You ain't going to find many agents in the office on Christmas Eve. Didn't have the $10,000 the corrupt... Let alone talking to a co uh, potential cooperating witness. The cop was demanding in less than an hour. What is the name of the office? When Skaboo contacted me, we realized that that was our best chance to do something about police corruption. And I... Uh, immediately arranged to meet him and, and debrief him in person. Uh, there was no way we could get everything together by 6 o'clock. Um, by the time I met with him, it was uh, 30 minutes before the deadline. Yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Um, Haddon and his partner quickly hashed out a plan. This is, I think, the best one we've got. Scabu would meet the officer as arranged, but he'd be wearing an FBI wire. The agents couldn't arrange $10,000 on such short notice. So, this is very important to know. Um, electronic surveillance, guys, is like the cornerstone of procure, uh, uh, getting evidence when it comes to the feds. 
uh, you need to be able to uh, video record or audio record criminals when they're conducting criminal activity. You know, this is how conspiracy cases are built. This is how large scale investigations are built. You need informants, you need a cooperating defendants, you know, you need undercover agents, which this case is going to show you guys all of that. But in this case, so this guy getting extorted, he owes $10,000 to this dirty cop on Christmas Eve, and he's telling him, hey, pay our extortion fees. So what does he do? He calls the FBI, listen, man, this shit's going on. I don't have the money, whatever. So this agent meets up with him with another guy. Hey, well, why are you up? Go meet with him. Let's see what we get. Because they know at this point, the FBI knows that there's dirty cops in the New Orleans Police Department, but they don't have anyone on the inside or anyone dealing with them. So this guy calls in and they're able to finally get their foot in the door in this public corruption case. And this is how it all begins. So, uh, you know, and this is great that he was able to kind of do this on the fly, meet with them so quickly, wire them up and then send them back out there. Um, because to be able to get $10,000, guys, within an hour or two is impossible. You know what I mean? You're going to need something called uh, purchase of evidence funds, right? And this is very difficult to procure because you need to sign, do mem memorandums, send them up the chain, go ahead and uh, get your, uh, you know, your supervisor, your first line supervisor to approve and then a second line supervisor, ten something like $10,000 back then in 1993, which would be the equivalent to like damn near 20000 now. You would probably need at least like a third line supervisor's signature to get that kind of money to be able to do a, a meet like this. So, you know, they don't have the ability to get that money now, but what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and send them in and you guys are going to see what they do next. Uh, and then Super Chats here, Raul. Uh, we got uh, Gabriel Badwolf goes five bucks all the way from the UK. UK does similar checks before granting security clearance. My brother had to go, had to get it for a government contract this company had for IT support. Yes, guys, when it comes to getting a clearance or being in any type of position where it's public trust, they're going to go through a background check and they're going to make sure that you're not in debt. Because when you're in crazy debt, you're going to do stupid shit and uh, sell secrets and or put yourself and or, you know, the U.S. government or the government that you work for in a compromising position, okay, for money. Scabu would have to convince the cop to accept smaller payments over several defense. meetings. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, they could be rough. Well, you know that. You work with them. Yeah, I have. Assured by Haddon that he would... Which, that was a very intelligent plan, by the way, by the, the case agent here, to tell the informant that you're going to pay him in increments. And the reason why that's important, guys, is you're going to be able to document each separate event, okay, and... Uh, you know, memorialize it in a report, and you're going to have more evidence. You're going to be able to build up more evidence uh, to show a pattern of activity. Be under constant surveillance. Scabu took his position. Officer Sammy Williams was still on duty when he arrived with a prisoner cuffed in the back seat of his cruiser. So this fucking guy shows up with someone in the back of his cruiser. JD Trini goes, when I started back in 2014, my salary was roughly 35K in a city that is one of the highest in crime. It forced you to do a lot of overtime just to get by. Yeah, man, it's tough, bro. It's tough. Um, yeah, this shit is like a movie. Yeah, bro, it gets better. Don't worry, guys. So let's keep going. So he picks up, he picks up the cooperating witness uh, with a suspect in the back of his car. <laughs> oh, Lord. Williams drove Scabu to a deserted spot behind a seafood market. He ordered him to throw the $10,000 into the trunk. Scabu told Williams he only had $3,000 now, but would pay the rest later. If the cop arrested Scabu, he'd never get his payoff. And guys, mind you, $3,000 in 1993 was the equivalent to like $6,000 today, okay? This is a lot of money. Remember, New Orleans police officers, we just well, we talked about it, are only making 16 k a year back in 1993. So this is almost like, almost ha damn near half of this guy's salary. Agents hoped Williams would agree to meet him again for more of the money. So Williams is a dirty cop, Skabu is the informant. He did. And the FBI had it all on tape. Hadn't believed this one incident would lay the groundwork for exposing more corruption in the New Orleans Police Department. Our main objective was to try and create a strategy that would enable us to prosecute as many bad officers as we possibly could. All right, so now the fucking games begin, guys, okay? Anytime you got dirty police officers or dirty law enforcement uh, personnel, 
it's immediately going to get accepted by a U.S. Attorney's Office, bro. Like these are the, the like the sexiest types of cases for federal prosecutors. Okay, so they do the meet. It goes well. He accepts the extortion money. Okay, and the FBI is able to collect that uh, electronically and witness it, which is huge. They could go ahead and get him right there for um for extortion and or bribery. But obviously. The FBI just always want to take down one dirty cop because if you got one dirty cop, more than likely there's a bunch of others. Because when you when you're a corrupt police officer, guys, when, when there's a corrupt police officer in the organization, a lot of the times they're going to be insulated and protected uh, from misconduct allegations or internal affairs by other dirty cops. Okay, so um, Stan obviously was intelligent enough to know, yo, this is probably going to end up being a conspiracy. He goes to the U.S. Attorney's Office right away and gets them on board, and we're going to see that here in a second. Which the U.S. Attorney's Office guys is the federal prosecutors. This is not to be confused with Assistant District Attorney's Office. This is federal. Assistant United States Attorney's Office, okay? And the U.S. Attorney is the top guy, and then underneath him are all his Assistant United States Attorneys, just like the District Attorney is the top guy, and all the Assistant District Attorneys underneath him. One's federal, one state. In the days that follow, agents, along with prosecutors from the United States Attorney's Office, began to plan their operation codenamed Shattered Shield. Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters would advise agents every step of the way on what would be needed to convict the dirty right. cops. Probably, probably we were involved really from day one. For this guy right here, Chevro TV, uh, you might have just come in late, bro. What I was saying was he got paid $3,000 in 1993, which is the equivalent to damn near $6,000 today. You got to understand, it's 2022 now, that money in 1993, that 3K was equivalent to way more than it is, uh, you know, back then. You know what I'm saying? It was, it was, it was a lot more. So they were only making $16,000, okay? We just showed the New Orleans Police Department salary back then. So it was damn near half of his stuff. That's what I'm trying to say. So these are the U.S. attorneys now. So these two guys, guys, prosecuted this case. This is uh, McMahon right here, and I forget this guy's name. But these were the two AUSAs that did this case, okay? Which, when you have a big complex case like this with a bunch of, uh, you know, with public corruption, um, <clears throat> you're going to have more than one AUSA on the case. Because it's going to be pretty complex. You guys are going to see that here in a second. We met with the case agents on numerous occasions and discussed exactly what we were interested in being developed as far as evidence in, in the case. As with most corruption cases, the FBI's strongest evidence would likely come from wiretaps. According to Special Agent Karen Jenkins, an FBI wiretap specialist, securing them isn't easy. And I've told you guys this before about um, Title III's, right, and wire intercepts and basic being able to um, intercept communication real time when people are <clears throat> committing criminal activities or doing facilitating conspiracies. It's extremely difficult. And she's going to outline it a little bit, add a little bit more to it. Title III is a court authorized intercept or wiretap. It's very difficult to get one approved. It's a lengthy process, very time consuming. Basically, we have to have approval by FBI officials to get one. And beyond that, we have to have the review and approval by Department to give the people a quick uh, little recap. So um, if you guys missed the beginning earlier, today we're covering Operation Shattered Shield. So let's rewind. We're covering Operation Shattered Shield. This was probably the biggest police corruption case in New Orleans history, guys. This occurred in the early 90s. Uh, basically, there was a crack epidemic going on. New Orleans was one of the top cities in the United States, if not the murder capital at the time in 93. Uh, we had Crack going crazy. People were selling drugs all over the place. The police were getting paid only about $16,000 per year, okay, back in 1993. And just so you guys can put that into U.S. standards today, that is the equivalent, guys, which I showed you guys here with this little inflation chart, of approximately $32,693, um, $32, okay? Um, and that's how much New Orleans police officers were earning at the time, guys. So... Yeah, it was, it was a wild time. So corruption was at all-time high. The pay was low. Drugs were at their highest. We we're de go dealing with the war on drugs, the crack epidemic. All that stuff was going on. And then on top of that, guys, we had police officers literally extorting drug dealers, you know, stealing from them, robbing them, taking their money, taking their dope, whatever it may be. 
and uh, running extortion rackets, goddammit. They were telling these drug dealers, yo, you got to pay up if you want to go ahead and be able to sell this crack or sell these drugs in this area, which is wild. You know, the police officers were literally extorting the drug dealers. And the crazy part is, it's not like the drug dealers could go to the fucking police station and be like, hey, listen, guys, you know, I got a profitable business here. I'm a crackanoor, you know, crackanoor, and I'm out here selling this work, and these fucking guys keep taking my money. I want to file a complaint. You know what's going to happen? They're going to they're gonna end up in fucking jail. So they couldn't do shit. So right now where we are, guys, is here's the recap of the investigation so far that you guys, have, you guys might have missed. So FBI agent Stan Hatton, okay, the case agent on this thing, he gets a call from an informant named Skabu. And he says on Christmas Eve, hey, this police officer, okay, is extorting me for $10,000. He says that I owe money um <clears throat> to him uh for basically extortion fees and uh and the agent you know is in the public corruption group and he knows that there's an issue with dirty police officers in 1993 in the new orleans police department so what does he do he arranges to meet the informant they meet he gives the and he wires up the informant okay and the informant goes to meet with the police officer as instructed so he goes and meets with the police officer unfortunately he doesn't have the ten thousand but he does have three thousand dollars so the fbi record the meeting the police officer meets with him, takes the $3,000. Skabu says, hey, listen, I don't have all the money, but I'll give you more money in the future. Bam. So the meeting ends. The fucking police officer goes off. The informant goes off. And now the FBI is on this dirty cop's tail. And now they know, okay, if we got one dirty police officer extorting drug dealers, there's probably more of them. Because like I said before in the first stream, guys, um, when, there's public, when there's police corruption, a lot of the times... It's widespread. It's not just one dirty cop because that dirty cop is going to have to be protected and insulated uh, from by other police officers, okay? The blue veil is what they typically call it. So <clears throat> so now that uh, they've identified that they have one dirty cop, they got him dead to rights on extortion, right? Because he accepted the money from the drug dealer. They go to the U.S. Attorney's Office, the federal prosecutors, and they say, yo, this is what's going on. We need to build this investigation uh, and we need to start, you know, getting these guys all right so they're starting to strategize how they're going to attack this investigation and where we left off was right here where we're explaining what title three intercepts are guys and title three intercepts guys are basically well actually we're, we're a little bit back from there um and this documentary guys is from the ni late 90s you know what i'm saying but it's still a very good documentary this is one of the prosecutors actually that was in prosecuting this case so uh so that I don't get hit with uh, copyright again, guys. What's going to ha probably ha have to happen is I'm going to have to stop the um, video fairly com uh, often and also comment on it, okay, so that we don't get too messed up with this. But let's keep going. There's evidence in, in the case. As with most corruption cases, the FBI is strong. Oh, and I also probably have to uh, speed, up, uh, speed it up a little bit so that we don't get or slow it down a little bit. Let's see here. Um, let's try it at one. And see what happens. This is what it normally is. I think if I speed it up, I mean, we'll see what happens. Just evidence would likely come from wiretaps. So they already know that they're going to have to use Title Threes in this investigation. Cirque V94 goes, I just want to say thank you. You guys got me changing my life. Shout out to King Keto. Got you, my friend. According to Special Agent Karen Jenkins, an FBI wiretap specialist, securing them isn't easy. Yes, it is hard as fuck to get. Title threes. Uh, someone saying speed it up. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Let me see if I could do a one point two five. Yeah, we're trying to get around this copyright thing for y'all. Uh, do they even have a? They don't even have a one point two five. Control shift and K. Let's see if that does anything. Title III is a court-authorized intercept or wiretap. It's very difficult to get one approved. It's a lengthy process, very time-consuming. Basically, we have to have approval by FBI officials to get one, and beyond that, we have to have the review and approval by Department of Justice officials. Finally, a federal judge will make the final determination as to whether or not one is authorized. So I've done Title Threes myself, guys, uh, and basically, this is how it goes. You get, your criminal, you get your criminal activity, you're able to establish that the phone that they're using or the location that you're going to bug is used in criminal activity, okay? After you establish that, you need a bunch of probable cause to be able to do it. You need to write, basically, you need more um, probable cause guys to, to get a Title Three than you do to arrest a person. Again, one more time. Yes, you heard me correctly. You need more probable cause, okay? 
to get Title Three intercepts than you do to actually arrest a person. All right, because keep in mind that when you do Title Three intercepts, not only are you invading that person's privacy, but you're also invading other people's uh, uh, private expectation of privacy as well. Because other people that may or may not be involved in the investigation are now being monitored by the government. Okay, so you need an abundance of probable cause to establish, yo, this person is involved in criminal activity. So, um, so after you get the affidavit written, not only do you have to send up your chain, now you got to send it to the Department of Justice. So something called OEO, okay, reviews it. Okay, and I know this because I've, I've done Title threes myself and I was an affian, which they're a pain in the ass to do, man. I, my affidavit was 75 pages long and I had to articulate in there why this guy was a drug dealer, why the people that he talks to on his phone are drug dealers. You have to identify a bunch of people in his tolls that are involved in criminal activity, all that shit. Once it goes over to OEO and Department of Justice approves it, they give it back to you and then you got to take it to a district judge. You don't take it to a regular judge, you take it to a district judge, which is the high, the, uh, a higher level judge than just a magistrate, okay? Magistrate judges sit over regular court cases, you know, that aren't necessarily criminal. They'll, you know, maybe see a person for initial appearance, but district judges are the ones that actually give out the, um, the judgments and once a case is indicted, it goes to a district judge, from a magistrate to a district judge, okay? And I'm running it on a little bit of a faster speed, guys, so that um, so that we don't get hit with that copyright, right? Um, let's see here. Uh, and we got the feds on to us, and that's from 12 Pack of Modellas. Thank you so much. Uh, what else do we got here? And I appreciate the donations, guys, because I'm probably not going to uh, monetize this video uh, because... I don't want to get hit with the copy stuff, so I appreciate the donations. Sorg V94, I just want to say thank you. You guys got me changing my life. Shout out to King. Okay, read that one from before. All right, cool. Let's keep going. After delivering two more payoffs to Officer Williams, Scabu had won. Ah, uh, see, that, that, that's, that doesn't sound good. So, okay, he did two more payoffs to the pl dirty police officer. Scabu did the informant is, is Scabu. Trust. Now the FBI seized the opportunity to take the operation to the next phase. Scabu would approach Williams with a proposition. Okay, so now they're going to go ahead and take the investigation to the next level. So now the informant is going to go to the dirty police officer because he's paid him now. He's built some trust with him. Okay, he's paid him three different times, 3000 bucks, so that he can go ahead and build that rapport because he owed the cop $10,000 for extortion fees. Okay? The volume of drug business was going to increase, and Scabu would need more cops to protect him. If Williams was interested in higher payoffs, he would need to hire more dirty cops to handle the expansion. See, so this is genius. They're expanding the informant's drug business so that they so that they can go ahead and get more dirty police officers involved in it. Because you're not going to be able to do all this with just one cop. You're going to have to get all his dirty cop friends with him to make the drug operation uh, work. But the issue here is that you got a lower, like a mid-level, lower-level drug dealer right, city drug dealer in New Orleans, how the hell are you going to be able to expand his drug uh, trafficking capabilities out of nowhere? So this is where you got to start getting creative as an investigator, okay? And I remember doing this myself because I've done a bunch of drug cases, and you guys are going to see what the FBI does here, okay? Williams took the bait. Williams is a dirty police officer, by the way, guys. Scabu met with him for another recorded payoff in mid-January 1994. Don't forget now. But this time, Williams showed up with another officer. Uh-oh, so he brings another cop with him. Who does he bring? He turned out to be Len Davis, Sammy Williams' partner. Len Davis. Don't forget now, man. It wasn't surprising. Oh, Davis shit. Was known in the and that, my friends, is the person who is the main file title of this investigation, okay? And you guys are going to see here in a second why. The projects as a gangster with a badge. They refer to him as a gangster with a badge, okay? And to give you guys a little bit more insight as to who this guy, Len Davis, actually is, uh, and I took my notes here, guys, because I, because I think it's important that you guys get his whole background here. Um, 1225. Okay. Bear with me one second here, guys. This one I'm probably going to play in a little bit more speed. Okay. Uh, playback speed. Let's go 1.25 on this bad boy. So this is Len Davis, guys. This is um the guy who came with the other dirty police officer who ends up being one of the main dudes here. Okay. AKA RoboCop. Uh, and then we got here 
Miami area code 304. Yo, Myron, shout out to you and Fresh for getting me through this week of almost losing my little bro and giving me the info on these 304s. We got you, my friend. So uh, let's go ahead and introduce Len Davis uh, right now. That he would have to bring somebody else in to help him do the protection operation. And he brought in Len Davis. Been a police officer since 1986. Len Davis joined the New Orleans PD in 1986. Known on the streets as RoboCop because of his aggressive policing style, he was also a de hey, it's Chris Poxon, guys. decorated officer. Len Davis was kind of a, a police folk hero. He had all these productivity awards. He won a medal in 93. But I've heard stories that are very distant. He uh, had no sense of quality arrest. And he was also affiliated with the worst elements in the police department. So he was out there in the streets, you know, making arrests, making things happen, whatever, you know. And more than likely, what happened was he saw opportunities where he can, you know, steal some money from dealers, steal some drugs, whatever it may be. And, you know, this is what happens. You know, corruption is always slow, guys. It starts with a little thing here, a little thing there. Next thing you know, you're full on telling drug dealers, yo, you got to pay me 10K on Christmas Eve, motherfucker. My relationship with Lynn... Okay, here's Adam D's guys. He was a former police officer as well with the New Orleans Police Department. He also got indicted uh, for conspiracy and corruption. Was, you know, we were friends. You know, I would go over by his house. They would come over by my house. You know, we worked together and even sometimes, you know, we would get together after work. I would say that we were we were pretty good friends. From what I yeah, he does. He really does look like Chris Boxen, bro. You guys are fucking hilarious here, man. <laughs> understand he asked to come to the 5th District. He wanted to be where the action was. But he was loud, cocky, but he wasn't one of those guys that worked. Yo, he said that's Mo's dad. <laughs> <laughs> On the fringes. He was a go-getter, you know. Len was known for taking people's dope. Okay, and that guy used to be a drug dealer. So he, you know, yeah, Len was known for taking people's drugs. Lynn was the type of dude that would have you taken away. Have you transported somewhere and never to be found again. So the corruption was rampant, guys. It was it was pretty bad. So now we know who Len Davis is. Let's go back to the documentary. Reviewing the tapes hadn't discovered a problem. What are looking for? Both Davis and Williams used the coded language of the drug trade. So Williams and Davis, the two dirty police officers, so they got all these recordings with the informant. However, they don't know what the hell these dudes are saying because the police officers are using street drug lingo, just like the criminals. <laughs> so, and this is very common, guys. When I did my drug case, for example, and I was listening to phones, they used to refer to uh, certain things as uh you know with different terms so i'll give you guys an example i did a big methamphetamine drug conspiracy case right so when they referred to methamphetamine they never said yo bro uh i need 10 kilos of ice no they would say yo i need a couple of squares right which would stand for kilogram or they would say hey uh you know i need some ice okay ice is a slang term for methamphetamine especially on the southwest uh, mexican border because the methamphetamine that comes from mexico is um very it's white it's not yellow it's not that bullshit shake and bake that these you know <clears throat> white supremacy groups make you know or these biker gangs it's legitimate uh strong methamphetamine that's like 98 percent fucking pure okay like breaking bad type stuff because in mexico the ingredients to make methamphetamine are not as heavily regulated as they are in the united states so they refer to it as ice um down on the southwest border okay so uh, so basically, when you're listening to, to wiretaps, or in this case, guys, they're not on wiretaps yet. Keep in mind, these are just recordings of the informant, Skabu, meeting with these dirty police officers. But it's very difficult for them to understand what the fuck they're talking about, because even the police officers are speaking in street code, okay? Because they're not dumb. They know that their activities are illegal, and they don't want to necessarily speak about things openly, okay? Aaron Poxon's real father. I'm looking for my son. Is he producing tonight? Yo, you guys are fucking hilarious. <laughs> The chat is undefeated. All right, let's keep going. To make charges stick, the FBI had to record the officers using language that a jury would understand. Hadn't pressed Scabu to get Williams and Davis to use words like dope, so there'd be no doubt at trial. Now this... Stupid! This was a big mistake by the case agent. Um, so... And you never want to put your informant in a position 
where they got to speak in a way that is unnatural, that's going to make them feel uncomfortable, that could uh, arouse suspicion to them potentially cooperating with the government. Having your informant say overt words like dope or cocaine or drugs or any of that other shit, it's going to put you in a bad predicament. Now, of course, you know, these, these, and, 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 you know, like I said before, I've been praising the case agent. He's been doing a great job on this investigation, but this is a very telltale sign uh, that he doesn't do drug investigations. When you do public corruption, a lot of the times you're going after dirty cops, dirty politicians, etc. These guys aren't involved in drug trafficking. They're involved in fraud. They're involved in embezzlement. They're involved in more sophisticated crimes. So for him as a public uh, corruption, a public corruption agent, he's probably not used to doing drug investigations. You, I would never, ever tell my informant, yo, uh, bro, I need you to uh, get the, the bad guys to speak in language um, that the jury's going to be able to understand. No, fuck that shit. The pattern of activity is going to be able to allow the jury to understand what the hell's going on here with the drug conspiracy. The actions are going to speak a lot louder than the words, okay? So... Um, this was a, a big error on the on the part of the of the case agent, you know. And I'm going to be uh, very objective here. I'm going to tell you guys when the case agent did a fantastic job and when he did a bad job. But this is a big fuck up here, which you guys are about to see. But when Scabu told the cops the dope is in, Davis suspected something was up. If you're uh, if you're in the police business and somebody and that's the man, the case agent Stan had, and so. Yeah, dude, you say, of course, he's going to be like, what the fuck did you just say, you know, talking about dope? Uh, Terrell Xavier, five bucks. What do you think of the Kobe Bryant Colorado case? Lots of things to learn from that situation. Also, perhaps break down the DC Sniper. DC Sniper, I'll break down eventually uh, the Kobe Bryant case, but he's innocent. We all know it. That girl did it for clout. He starts using words that are that overt and that plain that immediately makes you suspicious that this uh, person is trying to set you up. Davis shoved Scabu into the car and told Williams to drive. So obviously he's fucking tight. Like, yo, what the hell? Why are you using words like that? So this is not good, okay? If I'm on surveillance and I see uh, a suspect grab my informant and throw him into the back of the car like that, bro, that is not good. You gotta get, because you, you're, you're responsible for the informant. This is an enforcement operation. If he gets hurt, it's not gonna be a good look. Obviously this is the 90s, right? So they weren't as uh, strict as they are nowadays, but this would never fly today, bro. So, they're on surveillance, they fucking say that stupid shit, now the cop is mad, let's see what happens next. The agents would be too conspicuous on the deserted streets. If they pursued the cops now, they would put Scabu's life at greater risk. The only thing they could do was sit patiently and listen to the wire. That's fucking crazy, bro. If that happened today, I would have to chase after my informant and, and break, I, I'd have to, I'd have to stop, uh, shut it down. You, you cannot afford to have your informant get hurt. But, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so they just got to let him go with the cops, man. Dirty cops. Let's see what happens next. We got 10 bucks from Don, Don PZ. I've been waiting for Fed all day, and then they tried to cut it off. I was salty. Don't worry, baby. I'm still here. We ain't going nowhere, man. I'm not fucking leaving. <laughs> okay. The show goes on. All right. car came to a stop. Davis's rage ignited. They're going crazy right now. They're pissed. He yelled that Scabu was never to say the word dope again. So now they're stripping him off. Why? They're probably looking for the wire now. You know what I'm saying? They're pissed off. Oh, fair use, by the way, guys. And yo, we hit 70,000 subscribers, man. So yo, shout out to y'all. <laughs> Yo, give me ones in the chat if you guys are enjoying this breakdown right now of Operation Shattered Shield. Um, like I said before, we got slowed down a little bit because the stream got cut off. So we missed the first portion of it, but I gave a quick little summary for y'all. Give me ones in the chat if you guys are enjoying this and you guys want me to break down more documentaries like this and give you guys real insight. Uh, and I'll be able to tell you guys like if the agents did a good job, bad job, whatever it may be, because I've done cases like this myself. So this is right up my wheelhouse. Oh, great. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it, man. You know, ain't nobody else on YouTube giving y'all content like this, so like the fucking video. Let's keep going. They immediately took him to a, a deserted location, aggressively searched him. Uh, you can hear the Velcro ripping loose on his clothes and stuff. And uh, that was a very tense moment. Davis insisted that he wouldn't go to jail for careless talk. I'll be terrified if my informant was getting stripped like this by two dirty cops. 
Scabu was sure he was going to die. Obviously, they're probably doing this for a little bit of dramatic effect, like with the gun and shit like that. They probably didn't, they didn't do all that. But, yeah. Miraculously, they never found it. So they never found the wire. He got lucky, man. He got really lucky. Um, but they were able to monitor everything, obviously. And you can hear all the clothes get ripped off and everything else like that. So this is obviously a very scary, dangerous time for the case agent. Because if they find a wire on him, who knows what the hell's going to happen? You know what I'm saying? Like, these cops know what they're doing is illegal. They know that what they're doing is going to put them in jail for a significant amount of time. Um, and, and it's unlike a drug dealer, right? That's a very amateur move. Yo, the dope is in. What the fuck? You know, no one that's a, a real dope dealer or a D-boy is going to say some stupid shit like that. You know what I'm saying? They're just not. That's just not how it goes. So, again, this is the case agent being uh, a little inexperienced when it comes to really running drug investigations. Uh, you can't speak in overt terms like this but again this agent isn't uh, he's not a drug agent this guy's from the public corruption group and public corruption normally don't do drug investigations like this their trust was restored okay you understand me so they trust him again now Skabu he stripped him and he's good and deal with davis and williams For the next job, the cops drove him to a store where a drop-off was to take place. Okay, what's a drop-off, guys? A drop-off, guys, typically is an exchange uh, for um, currency for drugs. And I've explained this before, guys, but I'll tell you guys how the drug game kind of works. In the drug game, you need to compartmentalize yourself. And what I mean by that is you need to mitigate risk. A lot of the times you're dealing with individuals that you don't necessarily know that may be a part of another organization or may be involved even in your organization. It's better for criminals to not necessarily know who's who, who does what, etc. Because if one person gets caught, everyone can go down. And this is how the mafia came down because um, when they were able to use racketeering, RICO laws, they're able to get people at the lower level to snitch on people on the higher levels to protect themselves. So when you're doing drop-offs like this, what you do is you drop the product off somewhere that's, you know, somewhat secure person goes picks it up and then payment is made or every, whatever it may be like that but typically you want to make sure that uh the transaction can be conducted with both parties not putting themselves in a compromising situation where they can be arrested or apprehended by law enforcement inside scabu checked a bag at the counter Yes, Zoji14 says Mafia is not gone. Yes, we know they're not gone, but they're not nearly as powerful as they were in the 70s, my friend. He passed the ticket to an agent posing as a buyer, who then retrieved the bag. And the police are standing guard there to make sure that the, that, that the drugs don't get ripped, okay? So basically, they're getting paid a significant amount of money to basically just chill with the cruiser there, make sure the drugs don't get stolen, Make sure, you know, Skabu gets whatever the hell he needs, whether he's getting paid or he's getting drugs, whatever it is. They're making sure that the facilitation of the transaction occurs safely, okay? Williams and Davis watched as each transaction went down. Thank you, Moesha Campbell, $100 uh, super chat. They were promised $1,000 for every kilo of cocaine they protected. $1,000 per kilo protected in 1993, guys. Again, I want you guys to see, uh, and now we know, that the New Orleans Police Department didn't get paid shit back then, okay? So $1,000, all right, is the equivalent to, uh, $1,000 in 1993 is equivalent to, no, that's what the fuck, that's, oh, from 1993, that, that, that's not right. Oh, yeah, yeah, almost $2,000 today. Sorry, my, my bad, guys. I had a brain fart there. So almost double, guys, and that's per kilo. Per kilo. So let's say it was five kilos. These guys make damn near $10,000. Okay? To so just sit there and let the transaction occur. So that's quite a bit of money. Remember, guys, the salary for a New Orleans police officer back then was $16,640. That's thirty-two grand today. So they're making almost one-third of their yearly salary just from watching five kilos of cocaine get exchanged. Crazy. Crazy, crazy. So I, this is why corruption was rampant back then. For them, the deals meant easy money. Davis and Williams met Skabu behind stores and alleyways for the protection payoffs. 
the FBI. And obviously the FBI is monitoring every single meeting. This is how it goes, guys. Whenever you have an informant and they go meet with criminals, you're recording every single interaction. You're there on surveillance. You're watching it. You're making sure you can identify other um, people, etc. I recorded every word. This was not during the crack era, guys. This was in 1993. This was going on. Operation Shadow Shield occurred. It was taken over. It was going down in 93, 94. Gradually, Operation Shattered Shield was building a solid case against police corruption. Do you know what a bird was going for back then? This is five star sports betting, five bucks. I don't know what a kilo was going for back then. Like, I mean, cocaine, cocaine prices, guys, range uh, and fluctuate dramatically depending on where you are in the United States. I know a kilo of cocaine when I was in Laredo, Texas, was around twenty to tw to thirty thousand dollars. You know, depending on how the market was. Um, and then if you got it up to like Chicago or New York City, you know, it would obviously balloon up to 50, 60 K per kilo. Right. And then on top of that, you can go ahead and cut it down, you know, cut one kilo down and double your money. So this is why the drug game is so profitable, because you can literally, you know, dilute the, qu dilute the quality of the drugs to make more money. Recordings continued into the spring of 1994. Once agents were sure Davis and Williams were solidly on board, the FBI prepared to expand the investigation. All right, so now the FBI is ready to expand this bad boy because you can only do so much with one informant. You got two dirty cops identified. Let's see how we expand this case. With still more cocaine to guard, Williams and Davis would need to recruit more dirty cops. Federal agents hope to snare every one of them. Like I told you guys before, public corruption cases are huge. So if they're able to find one dirty cop, they're going to go ahead and see and identify as many of them as they can and prolong the investigation to make sure they get every single dirty police officer. The U.S. Attorney's Office loves public corruption cases like this because they're sexy. They know it's going to hit the news. They know it's going to get lead to indictments. It's going to lead to lengthy sentences. It's going to lead to press releases. It's going to lead to a bunch of different things. So if you can uh, nab dirty cops, man, it's, it's, it's a big W for, uh, for the U.S. Attorney's Office. So they're always going to take those kinds of cases. They're very sexy. The U.S. Attorney's Office, um, a lot of the time, are cloud chasers. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Oh, oh my bad. But agents knew the officers may become suspicious of Scabu's rapidly growing drug business. They needed to bring in a big time dealer. Someone whose status as a kingpin would explain the larger shipments. He likes Oh, it did it again? Alright. Uh did, it, did they kill the stream again? God damn it. Let me see here. Yo, is it uh, still on Twitch, guys? Are we still on Twitch? All right, guys, come on over to Twitch. Come over to Twitch, guys. Yeah, come on over to Twitch, guys. Come on over to Twitch. I'll give it a minute and wait for y'all to come on Twitch. I knew this was probably going to happen. So come on over to Twitch, my ninjas. Come on over to Twitch. Okay. Uh, I think we're still live on Twitch. So let me go ahead and view this thing on Twitch. I think I'm still live. Let's see. Oh, yeah, we're still live on Twitch. So, oh, YouTube is back? Back on YouTube? God damn it, man. All right, well, fuck it. All right, we're back up on YouTube. So I think what I got to do, guys, is just stop it for a little bit and give some more commentary. I think that's honestly what it comes down to. So, um, so let's keep going. You know, I ain't going nowhere, gentlemen. We're going to keep doing this bad boy. The show goes on. All right. Fucking wrecking ball to take me out of here. All right, let's keep going, guys. We're back, baby. Some... Okay. Okay. So now they're gonna introduce an undercover agent, guys. All right. So let's go back. You guys might have missed that a little bit here. So now we're gonna go ahead and introduce a big time dealer, someone whose status as a kingpin would explain the larger shipments. You like some? Okay. Uh, let's see here. 
Yeah, come on over, guys. You can check me out on Twitch or on YouTube, either or, man. I mean, we're back now, so we're good money. Let's keep going. Okay. Hadn't called on Juan Jackson. Juan Jackson. Juan Jackson. agent trained specifically JJ for working undercover. A... So they brought in Special Agent Juan Jackson, okay, guys, who specifically does um, undercover cases. Um, and they're going to introduce him in a certain light, and you guys are going to see right now. Drug kingpin from, from up in the East Coast. At that time, I was in New York City, and I have been contacted uh, to come down. And that's Juan right now. So this documentary is a little bit older. He was still on the job, guys, when they did this documentary. So that's him right now. Uh, and then the Twitch link, guys, here. I'll pin the Twitch link for y'all right now. Uh, give me one second. I'll pin it for y'all in the chat. Oh, uh, YouTube done? Come on over to Twitch then, my ninjas. Come on over to Twitch. Okay. Come on over to Twitch. I'm trying to pin this bad boy. Will it let me? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, just go. You. Uh, oh, nope, wrong one. Hold on. It's twitch.tv slash fresh and fit podcast. There we go. That's it right there, guys. I'll wait for y'all to come on over to Twitch. Yeah, I, I don't know. YouTube is acting lame. I know. I know. I know, guys. I know. It sucks. So what's your thoughts on this so far, uh, Jay, uh, while we wait for the people to pile in on, on Twitch? Um, I mean, aside from the fact that it keeps stopping. <laughs> yeah, that kind of sucks. No, um, no, it's interesting, and it's interesting to hear your take on it. Obviously, I haven't seen um, any of these videos before, but it's interesting to hear it from your perspective of somebody that, that did this line of work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Cool. Um, what's your thoughts so far on uh, the crazy corruption? <laughs> I mean, it's crazy. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay, guys. Come on over to come on over to Twitch, man. Just come on over to Twitch. Okay, guys, and we'll be fine. I'm a, I'm gonna post a link in in Twitch right now. Come to Twitch. It's Twitch.tv. Okay, slash. Uh, Fresh and Fit Podcast. Now go ahead and pin that for y'all too. Oh, well, I'm on my Fresh and Fit account. Give me one sec, guys. Thanks for bearing with me here, guys. Come on over to YouTube. Oh, I think we're back up now. We're back up on YouTube again. But yeah, just go over to Twitch, guys. Come on over to Twitch. That way you'll be you won't have any issues because I already know when I um when I do this is going to be an issue. Twitch.tv slash Fresh and Fit Podcast. Okay, and I'll pin it for y'all. All right, we're back on YouTube, but I already know they're gonna keep they're gonna keep doing this probably. So, come on over to Twitch, guys. I see 482 of you guys here on YouTube. Might want to go to Twitch. All right. Uh, let's see here, because what I'll probably do is I'll probably have to edit this bad boy and then put on YouTube for y'all as as like a separate thing. But anyway, all right. So they introduced this other undercover agent, Juan Jackson, okay, guys, because they want to scale up the drug, the drug, uh, <clears throat> the drug game. So let's keep going. Um, to just uh, be interviewed and go over the actual case. A lot of times they'll they'll be looking for a certain person, height, weight, you know, color, or whatever. Bam. So you got it. They, they want agents that fit a certain uh, mold. So we're gonna go ahead and play this portion of Vice where they introduce undercover special agent Juan Jackson um, right here. But authorities still lacked the smoking gun needed to file any charges. So five months into the investigation, they upped their game and called in a pro. So five months is the case. Obviously, they're only able to do so much with Skaboo, right? It was important to bring in a deep undercover because to use a local agent was it was too risky. So now that's one of the AUSAs that was prosecuting this case. We brought in Juan Jackson to pose as this big time dope dealer from Miami. Bam. So this happens in May 1994. They introduce Juan Jackson, a.k.a. JJ. 
we wanted to introduce JJ to Sammy and Lynn personally. And so we all met at the Hilton Hotel in New Orleans in a hotel room. When Lynn now, this is a big deal that they meet at this hotel room. So let's go back to the original doc, and we're gonna, I'll talk about that meeting in, in uh, the hotel room in a second. Um, to infiltrate or get into a certain group. Known as JJ, the agent would act as Scabu's cocaine supplier, proposing to use New Orleans as a hub to store and distribute his product nationwide. I was. A now, that's very important, guys. The informant and the undercover agent have to come to a store together. High level drug dealer. I played that role and I had ties where my operation uh, was in both Miami and in New York City. So obviously very believable. We know that Miami and New York City are two huge drug corridors in the United States. So it would make sense that, you know, he would be a higher level drug trafficker that's supplying Skaboo. So basically the undercover agent is putting himself higher than the informant. Hey, the informant gets the drugs from me. So now this is going to force the police officers to deal with the undercover agent, okay? Get him more involved. With the arrival of JJ, Shattered Shield is about to grow from a minor drug business to a booming enterprise. Jackson was one of the FBI's best undercover agents. He was smart and experienced. So they put one of their top undercover guys on this case, guys, uh, for obvious reasons. I mean, anytime you got... Public corruption, dirty cops, whatever, the stakes are extremely high. So you're going to go ahead and recruit some of the best uh, undercovers for a case like this because there's no room for error, man. You can't fuck this one up, okay? So the informant has been dealing with these dirty cops for five months, so he's built an enormous amount of trust. So now he's going to be able to come in and introduce the undercover, which is very common in federal investigations where an informant makes an introduction of an undercover agent, and then the undercover agent starts to assume more of the criminal responsibility to alleviate the informant of some of that stress, okay? But his life would be in the hands of the informant, Skabu, who had no training. Jackson needed to build complete trust with Skabu, or they'd both be dead. Guys, I can't speak about how important it is for the informant and the undercover agent to be on the same page, bro. It is fucking life or death a lot of the times, especially when you're in a high stakes situation like this. When I had my personal case, when I had my cases in Laredo, I was doing an investigation where we were buying guns off of uh, cartel dudes and cartel associates. And um, my, uh, my undercover agent was introduced by an informant and that informant had to build rapport with these guys for months before I can introduce the undercover agent. And the undercover agent came in as a dude that travels all over the place and buys, procures firearms for, you know, for people in Mexico, because it's very difficult to get guns in Mexico. So, and there's obviously a war going on. A lot of the guns that end up in Mexico are guns that are purchased in South Texas, California, whatever it is. So we basically had like a kind of like a gun running operation where we were purchasing firearms from dudes in South Texas and, you know, under the guise that we work for cartel people in Nuevo Laredo. And we were only able to do that because the, the informant had done a really good job of building rapport with these guys. He had bought, done several transactions with them. Everything went off with it without a hitch. They never made us on surveillance or whatever else like that. So there was trust. So when he comes and introduces the informant, yo, this is my guy. He got a lot of money. He wants to buy guns. It's going to be a seamless transition, which is why this process is critical to the success of the investigation. The informant, because he lives that world, is probably the for me anyway, the most important, because he himself has been there. He's been around these people. If he's not believable, it's not going to work. And I think uh, that was the big thing for me down there, was to make sure that uh, we were going to be believable. Jackson and Skebu rehearsed their roles again and again, preparing for the real test with Davis and Williams. Jackson, federal agent from the North, and Skebu, a Southerner who had dealt drugs all his life, had to forge a common history. So now they're coming with a cover story, meeting up. Hey, what did you do? And now they're going to start to kind of build a story so that when they're around these criminals, they're going to be able to uh, be seamless. Their story would be that they had met in the army. After their stint was up, they'd kept in touch. They hashed and rehashed details of their friendship, habits, fake memories that they'd have to know cold and when to say them. They were dealing with criminals who could run thorough background checks. And who 
So this is another thing. This is a very unique situation because they're dealing with police officers, guys. So when you're an undercover agent, right, and you're dealing with uh, police officers, this this could be very dangerous because now they can kind of go ahead and identify who the hell you are, do a background check, all this shit. So you got to make sure that you're really on point because these guys have the ability to go ahead and run your information, okay? We're free to use deadly force. We knew that whatever we had, we had to keep it simple, but we had to make sure that we remembered certain things. The biggest thing I thought that helped us was my initials, my nickname. So no matter how many times they would ask him, what's his name? He believably said, because he only knew, <laughs> JJ. In April, the FBI was ready to introduce JJ into the operation. He arrived at a hotel carrying what was supposed to be a drug payment of $100,000. For the first time, Williams and Davis caught a glimpse of the big time dealer. So, so this is critical, guys. This is uh, the first intro. So basically, the police officers are kind of watching a drop here of money of $100,000 suspected of U.S. currency. So they're going to go ahead <clears throat> and... Uh, this is important. You know, you got to walk the talk. You got to, you know, talk the talk and walk the walk. So this is a moment of truth here. Their perceptions would be critical. The first encounter was in the Sheridan Hotel. They were going to stand at a distance and just observe. It was another test to see if they were willing to do what they were going to do. Hey, I don't know how it's going to work. They could arrest me right now and take me off and, you know, I'm down. You know, because it's supposed to be drug money. So uh, it was a test. Scabu told the cops about JJ and his plan to use New Orleans as a transport hub for his cocaine business. Davis and Williams carefully studied JJ's every move. Jackson was so this is important as well, guys, that he has to have a believable story that he's trying to use New Orleans as a how do I say this as as a as a transit location. So there's major drug hubs all over the United States, guys, and um, you know places like. San Antonio, Houston, Atlanta, uh, you know, Miami, Florida, New York City, uh, Los Angeles, Phoenix. These are all major cities where drugs typically go and are held for a period of time. Some of the drugs are taken out, right, and distributed, and then um, uh, then another portion of the drugs is continued to is being moved, right? Is is going to continuously be moved throughout the United States. So, uh, so it's very believable to say, yo, I need New Orleans as a staging location, essentially, which we're going to get into that here in a second. But that's the, that's the line that they're trying to sell to the police officers here. It's creating his character before their eyes. It would become his full-time identity, and it would have to hold up under scrutiny. Everything depended on what the cops thought they had seen, and if they believed the cash exchange was genuine. The plan worked. The cops were convinced that JJ was the real deal. Bam. So they got him, okay? Now the police actually think this dude is a real drug, uh, big level drug kingpin from uh, Miami slash New York. Gotcha, bitch! The FBI was now poised to take Operation Shattered Shield to the next level. By the spring of 1994, the FBI's Operation Shattered Shield targeting New Orleans police officers involved in the city's drug trade was in place. So now, so let's do a quick little recap on the investigation, how it went through. Because we've had some interruptions and everything else like that, so I'll let you guys know what's been going on for some of you guys that are joining us late. 1993, the FBI gets word that the New Orleans Police Department is filled with corrupt police officers that are ripping off dealers, stealing from dealers, extorting dealers, and um, other issues of corruption. Uh, an informant is getting extorted by a police officer, a.k.a. Officer Williams, for $10,000 on Christmas Eve of 1993. So what happens is that uh, that drug dealer goes ahead and calls the FBI Public Corruption Group and says, Hey, this police officer, he wants $10,000 from me. I don't have the money. Help me. So the agent meets with that informant. They wire him up. They send him to go meet that police officer. The informant doesn't have $10,000, but he does have $3,000. They record the meeting. The informant gives the $3,000 to Williams. And William says, okay, you know what? Just pay me on other occasions. So the FBI is able to set up other meetings, okay, with this dirty police officer and this informant where he pays them $3,000 on each meeting. 
During one of the meetings, the police officer Williams brings his co-conspirator, a.k.a. Officer Len Davis, okay? Len Davis goes ahead and uh, starts, you know, kind of to lead the situation, and he becomes the main dirty cop, okay, from Williams. And they accept bribery payment, not bri well, yeah, it is kind of bribery, but they're also accepting drug payments to basically watch the informant go ahead and dro make drop-offs, they're paying him money for extortion, all this stuff, okay? And the FBI is recording each of these meetings with Len and Williams. However, the uh, FBI and the U.S. Attorney's Office is more interested in uh, identifying other members that are uh, corrupt in this police organization, New Orleans Police Department. So what do they do? They introduce an undercover agent posing as a high-level drug trafficker from Miami and New York that deals in high volumes of cocaine and high volumes of U.S. currency. Why? Well, they want to scale up the drug operation to do what? To force Len Davis and Williams to hire and recruit other dirty police officers to protect this drug trafficking organization and operation that is operating out of New Orleans, Louisiana, and facilitate the safe transportation uh, of drugs from an interstate uh, uh, from an interstate perspective. Okay, so now introduce JJ, FBI Special Agent Undercover. He's now uh, f successfully dropped off $100,000 to the informant. The police officers see this. They're like, okay, this guy's the fucking real deal. Now it's time for the FBI to really take this case to the next level. All right, so that's where we are right now. Hope you guys enjoyed that recap. Like the video if you're on YouTube. The stream is still down over there. Oh, it's back up now on YouTube. We're back up on YouTube. <laughs> so I got to turn it out for a little bit and explain things, and then they let me fucking go back on YouTube. But don't worry. What's going to happen, guys, after this is I'm going to go ahead and post this on YouTube. I'm going to clean it up a little bit and put it on YouTube for y'all. So, <clears throat> yeah, I don't know why they're fucking with the YouTube stream. But don't worry. I'll put this back up uh, there for y'all. So uh, let's go ahead and continue playing this bad boy. Posing as a drug kingpin named JJ, undercover special agent Juan Jackson worked with Scabu, the drug dealer turned FBI informant. Scabu rented a hotel room for JJ to meet officers Len Davis and Sammy Williams for the first time. Okay, so this is a big meeting right now, guys. Um, when you do meetings like this, undercover meets with with the with your uh, undercover agent and the bad guys. It's extremely dangerous because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what could be said. You don't know if they're armed. You don't know what the hell's going on. Now, in this case, you were two police officers, which is fucking wild because you already know that they're going to have guns. You already know that they're going to be on high alert. You already know that they're going to be more susceptible to law enforcement tactics. Uh, they're going to be smarter than your average criminal. Criminal. Okay. Now, I actually have footage of this meeting in the hotel. And I'm going to play that for y'all right now. And you guys are going to see... Uh, JJ just being a really good undercover agent here, okay? And this is the actual footage from the uh, hotel meeting, okay? Uh, in 94, I think they met, okay? At the Hilton in New Orleans, uh, Louisiana, all right? So let's get this bad boy going. And if you guys are watching on YouTube, go ahead and, uh, man, they keep killing the stream on YouTube. This is hilarious. All right. We wanted to introduce JJ to Sammy and Lynn personally. And so they all met at the Hilton Hotel in New Orleans in a hotel room. When Lynn and Sammy showed up. So there's Sammy Williams and there's Len Davis, the two corrupt police officers. As soon as they came in, JJ proposed to them that they all strip down so that everybody could see that nobody was wired. And so Very smart. Hey, I'm not wearing a wire. I don't know if y'all are the police, but I want you guys to strip down. I'm going to strip down. So everybody did. JJ gave him an opportunity to search the room to see if there was any bugs, wires, whatever in the room, which the officers did. Very ballsy for him to do that, by the way. Tell them, hey, go ahead and search the room, guys. The room was well monitored with recording devices and cameras. The FBI did a phenomenal job in this case. Yeah, I'm actually impressed. This is 1993, so, you know, you're not going to have, like, the best equipment back then. And here's your boy, uh, Stan Hatton, again, guys. You can see he's a little bit older now. Uh, the documentary I was showing you guys before was from 98. This this one, I think, is, like, 2016, 2017. So you can see he's a little bit older. And once they had done this search, they sat down and they had a conversation. Juan Jackson presented that he wanted to use New Orleans as a transshipment point for cocaine, typically going west to Houston. What's this going to be? Why? Because Houston, like I told you guys before, is a huge drug hub uh, in the United States. 
So New Orleans is obviously going to be a, a typical stopping point because um, uh, Interstate Highway 10, guys, connects Houston and, uh, and New Orleans. And I'll show you guys this real quick on a map. Uh, New Orleans, right? And I've broken this down for you guys before, how drug trafficking works in the United States. Would you guys, if you want to see it, you can go ahead and uh, check it out on um, my other video uh, on Breonna Taylor. But as you guys can see, Interstate Highway 10, okay? So you go here, right? The drugs come in, right, through Mexico, typically, all right? And you got, you know, these major highways. One big route, guys, I can break down for y'all right now is enter from Nuevo Laredo, okay, where the Cartel del Noreste is, goes in, uh, into the United States right here through Laredo, all right? This is where I used to be when I was stationed as an agent. Goes up into, into high, uh, Highway uh, 35, Interstate Highway 35, okay? And keep in mind, guys, the United States... Odd numbers mean north-south, even numbers means e east-west, okay? So it gets up here to San Antonio, which is critical. Why? Because San Antonio has this magical highway right here, Interstate Highway 10. Interstate Highway 10, guys, okay, takes you from Los Angeles, right? You can see it right here, Highway 10, all the way to Jacksonville, okay? So if you're a drug trafficker, you got one highway that takes you all across the United States, gets you wherever the hell you need to go. So the drugs typically come in through Mexico into the United States, a lot of times through South Texas, and then goes, or it comes from Miami, right? In this case, it's coming from Miami, because remember, JJ's posing to be a Miami drug trafficker, comes in from Miami, and he needs to get it to where? To Houston, right? Well, look at what's in the middle of Houston and Miami, New Orleans, okay? And look which highway connects the two. Interstate Highway 10, okay? So 10 also goes through Houston, all right? So this makes sense from a drug trafficking perspective. Miami, you take 95, bam, all the way up to Jacksonville, or you could take 75, whatever you want to do, and then bam, you can get across on 10, and then 10 will take you to New Orleans, and then eventually right here, to Houston, which is a huge drug <clears throat> hub in the United States, because Houston gets drugs not only from Mexico, but also from Miami. Okay, so like the fucking video, because you guys are. Who breaks down cases down to this level, man? I used to do this shit. This is what I used to do. Okay, you ain't gonna find another YouTuber or content creator out there that breaks this stuff down to this level of detail. Uh, let's see here. So let's go back to, um, the undercover meeting with JJ and these guys using New Orleans as a transshipment location. He wanted a secure location, security 24 seven. All we want to do is bring something in, sit down for a while. All right. I was talking about a way to have the G before. We might have one, we might need another. He wanted the cops to, um, guard, in this case, a warehouse. Now, that's a big deal, the fact that he wants them to guard a warehouse. And you guys are going to see why that's very important here in a second. Or between two and four days, every single month, while the coke was being temporarily stored there. Anything within the city limits while we're working, it can be done. Anything within the city limits while we're working, it can be done. Look at that. Lynn Davis, man, calling the shots. It's also critical in this conversation, as per the U.S. Attorney's Office, that they wanted to get a clearly established on tape that we weren't just talking about dope, but they wanted it on tape that they were talking about cocaine. And so JJ very skillfully maneuvered. Now you guys are probably trying to like asking, well, yo, why is it so important that it's cocaine? Well, the reason why it's so important guys to establish that it's cocaine is because there's different sentencing guidelines depending on the drug that you're trafficking. So for example, you're going to get more time, right? For dealing with like methamphetamine and heroin than you will for like marijuana. Okay. So, um, it's very important, uh, to identify what type of drug is being uh, involved in the drug trafficking conspiracy. So in this case, they're talking about cocaine, which uh, you're going to see here in the meeting. It comes up. Hoovered the conversation, and JJ never actually said cocaine, but Lynn Davis did. You could be 100% legit. It could be someone you deal with that we're not familiar with that might be into you, and you not know it, and then we were using words like cocaine, right, 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 right. and then you got problems. Bam. Gotcha, bitch. That's a big deal. That's a lot. That's, that's fantastic evidence on the part of the FBI to be able to get him to say that because now we've established what, my friends? Oh shit! Oh, Knowledge. Shit. Oh, shit. 
Knowledge is a critical element when it comes to federal drug trafficking laws. And I'll tell you guys how it's important. Let's say someone comes into the United States on a truck, right, smuggling 100 kilos of cocaine on a, uh, you know, in the back of his tractor trailer. Well, when he gets caught by customs and they call over the, you know, the Homeland Security agents, right, because I've done this myself, you need to establish that that truck driver knew that there was cocaine in the back of his truck. You ne they need to have knowledge, right, for the conspiracy to actually stick. So in this case, they're able to establish that Len Davis not only knows that he's protecting a warehouse, but more importantly, he's protecting a warehouse that is storing cocaine. That made it very clear that we were talking about a cocaine protection operation. We pretty much left it up to Stan Haddon and his squad uh, to develop the evidence because JJ, the undercover, the dope dealer, demanded 24 seven security. Len Davis and Sammy Williams could not have done that all by themselves. See that guys, that right there, my friends, <laughs> extremely intelligent to say, I need 24 seven security on the warehouse for my drugs. Why is that important? Because it's going to force Len Davis and Williams to recruit other police officers, okay, that are uh, potentially dirty to watch the warehouse, okay? But we're gonna run into a little issue here in a second. For that amount of time, which meant they would have had to recruit and bring in other corrupt officers to man those details. All right. At the end of 1993, the FBI was tipped off to possible police corruption in the New Orleans Police Department by a local drug dealer. With his help, they monitored patrolmen Len Davis and Sammy Williams for five months before they decided to send in an undercover. Bam. After recording the two partners talking about moving and selling large amounts of cocaine, the feds hatched a plan to try and catch the cops in the act. All right, so this is the warehouse strategy, right? Now, we're going to run into a little bit of an issue with the warehouse strategy. I'm going to fast forward here on this one. Right? Because now, let's see here. Hitch, uh, they bought JJ's uh, act. Uh, they JJ and Scabu met Davis and Williams for a walkthrough. Okay. So now they're showing them the warehouse. Okay. JJ and Scabu. And I'm going to go ahead and play this, guys, at a faster speed. I think that might help us with this uh, copyright issue. Okay. So. We meet with Lynn Davis and Sammy Williams at the warehouse for what we call the pre-deal meet. There so they met for the pre-deal meet. There at that meeting, they would discuss when the dope was coming in, how long it was going to stay in, in town, and how much money JJ was going to pay for the officers to guard the dope. Once inside, Davis told JJ that he had half a dozen more officers lined up to guard the cocaine shipments. Okay, so he tells them, I got six other cops that can do this. All right, which that's huge. Because now they're going to potentially be able to indict more police officers that are involved in corruption. All right. Uh, do we have any? Ch so what are your thoughts on this so far, Jay, while I catch up on these chats? Um, <laughs> no, it's just it's it's crazy to see that something like this like went on, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it's interesting. OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she was half asleep, guys. I had to say something. I, no, yeah. <laughs> They would work in 10-hour shifts. Uniform police outside, guarding payloads of cocaine inside. So work 10-hour shifts, uh, operating payload. Can you guys hear um, the... I, I know I got it sped up. Let me know if you guys... Can you guys still hear the narrator clearly and everything else like that? Give me ones in the chat if you guys can still hear them clearly. Play it a little bit here so we don't get hit with the... Oh, they still st took the stream down. Fuck it. It is what it is. Then you know we'll just play at regular speed. They're still taking it down anyway. So, all right, let's keep going. Up to a quarter of a million dollars were within each load. At that June meeting came the first big payments from JJ. More than ten thousand dollars. So he pays them ten thousand dollars, right, to kick this thing off. Which again, let's go ahead and pull up our uh our uh Goddamn, where the hell is this thing? Right here we go. Our inflation little calculator. $10,000 back then. Probably around 20000 Yep, $19,647,000. For $47,000. Sorry. $19,647. So let's uh, go back. Which again, is more than their yearly salary, goddammit. All right. 
everything is going smooth. Or almost as much as their yearly salary. Sorry, they're only getting paid 16k back then in '93. But one aspect of the warehouse plan bothered Assistant U.S. Attorney Al Winters. Okay, so here's the issue with the warehouse plan that's actually very important that the prosecutor is going to bring up. Okay, guys? And the Vice documentary didn't talk about this, but I think it's very important for you guys to see this. Remember how I told you guys knowledge is very important? So let's go ahead and uh, break this down. Basically, what we told the agents, unless we had evidence, irrefutable evidence, that these people knew they were guarding cocaine, we couldn't prosecute it. Right. That's because huge. The they need to know. Guard outside the warehouse, they could later claim they didn't know that drugs were inside. I think having some sort of video or hadn't had to find a way to prove Davis's recruits saw the drug shipments. Or maybe even see His team mulled over ways to bring the drugs into plain view. So now that makes it very difficult because now the FBI has to prove that the cops that are guarding the thing actually know that it's drug because they have plausible deniability all they can say is yo len davis recruited me to watch these drugs bro like it's not me like i don't know what you're talking about it was just a police detail you know which police details are 100 percent legal guys okay said okabo goes question what's the benefit of being an informant uh you triggered my trap card you don't have to go to jail you get paid you know or or you you have sig serve significantly less times there's there's a lot of uh, benefits to being an informant there's people that are career informants bro that make quite a bit of money doing the uh providing information to the government so The officers would have to be recorded seeing and discussing the shipment. Shipments were delivered to the warehouse one weekend every month according to schedule. Alright, so I think I'm gonna kill the have to kill the YouTube stream here, guys, because uh they keep um <laughs> they keep shutting it down. Yeah. So alright, I'm uh, I'm gonna shut the YouTube stream down. We're dead on YouTube, guys. We going on YouTube. We straight we twitch now, so come on over to Twitch. Then in mid July, the FBI sent a shipment that the guards didn't expect. With one load already in the warehouse, an FBI agent dressed as a courier brought another shipment. The driver shocked the guard cops by unloading the cocaine in plain sight. This was too overt for Len Davis's crew. They didn't want to see drugs at all. So obviously this is putting them in a very scary position. You know what I mean? Because now, they're like, yo, fuck, like, are we gonna, um... You know, are we going to get in trouble with this shit? Like, what's going on? You know, like, th th these fucking guys are over here. Because they know that some bullshit's going on, but they don't know exactly what's going on. So, uh, so obviously they're very scared. They didn't want the vehicles outside the warehouse unloading drugs and stuff where the officers could actually see it. Quickly, get down here. The cops called okay. Sammy Williams right. on a cell phone J.J. had given him. Williams called J.J., and JJ and Scabu raced to the warehouse. Come here, come here, JJ come here, responded you like a hot-headed drug crazy? dealer. You, you know what the, you I was arguing with this guy. I mean, we were actually screaming at each other. This is good acting, though. This is good acting. They're trying to really sell it. Like, yo, what the fuck are you doing? What, what are you doing? We, you know, we, you know, where are you? Whatever. And he's observing this. Because a police officer calling Lynn, telling him all what's going on. And how this doesn't look good. To the cops, this whole drug operation was starting to look dangerously unprofessional. Concerned, the driver made another call. So the undercover agent and the informant are arguing with another undercover agent that, you know, overtly was moving drugs into the warehouse. And the cops are like, what the fuck is going on? Why the hell are we seeing this? Like, yo, you guys are putting us in a bad spot because now we actually don't have that plausible deniability anymore, goddammit. Which is exactly what the feds want. Sammy Williams arrived to straighten out the problem. Oh, okay, okay. JJ explained it was the driver's screw. 
He asked that the cops escort the van to the city limits right away. Despite the risk, the episode worked. It showed that the cops knew what was inside the warehouse. Right, what's going on? And it was all video. Let them go. Just let them go. But so now he's telling them, hey, just escort this fucking dope dealer to the edge of town, you know, whatever. So. And uh, don't worry, guys. Um, Yeah, YouTube took it down, but it's cool. We'll, we'll be straight. Yeah, I don't think I got a strike. The episode rate just got a warning. So uh, I'll, I'll talk with my YouTube guy and get it handled. But for now, we're going to keep going. Show goes on, baby. We're going to keep go breaking this thing down. Yo, give me uh, we're, we're live on Twitch right now. Go ahead and give me ones in the chat if you guys are enjoying this, man. Uh, give me ones in the chat. See how y'all... Okay, cool, cool, cool. Are you guys enjoying this insight? Okay, awesome, awesome, awesome. I'm glad you guys are enjoying this bad boy. So... The show goes on! This is my home! They're gonna need a fucking... Let's keep going. His doubts for the cops. Either JJ was an amateur, or he was part of a stink. Either way, they'd be watching him more closely now. Shattered Shield wore on into the summer as all of New Orleans baked. About 100 degrees on there. In August, guarding the warehouse proved hard duty. The cops complained of the wear and tear on their engines from running the air conditioning all day in the heat. They wanted a vehicle that was more comfortable, that could also endure the long hours, perhaps a van. The officers asked Len Davis to provide one, and Davis brought their request to JJ. This is fucking crazy what you guys are about to see right now. So this literally, bro, is like the opportunity of a lifetime, okay? Just like like if I was the case agent here, I would just be like <laughs> You guys are gonna see what happens here in a second. For the investigation, it was a huge break. The sweaty cops had just handed the FBI a golden opportunity. It was a stroke of luck. One day Lynn uh, approached me and said that the officers were complaining that uh, they're running their cars in air condition and the cars are starting to overheat, you know, they're burning gas, you know, on and on and on. Once we were able to rent the van and, and, and put the listening device inside, we were able to hear a lot more conversations. The FBI quickly filed the paperwork to get court authorized wiretaps for the van. Technicians carefully installed state of the art microphones. So again, they had to go ahead and get paperwork done for Title Three, right? To go ahead and be able to wiretap the vans. But at this point, obviously, they had a bunch of communication. They've uh, with the dirty police officers. They're able to establish, yo, we need to wiretap this van because not only are we going to be able to get, you know, evidence, but we're also going to be able to, you know, get protection of the undercover agents. See what these guys are plotting, and you guys are going to see here. It's going to get even crazier here in a second. But they're going to be able to collect a whole bunch of evidence as far as what the hell the police officers are talking about while they're sitting in the van protecting the drugs and is going to be able to prove knowledge okay which we talked about before is extremely important they had to yield top sound quality for months with no maintenance the van was a perfect trojan horse for getting inside information I picked this out myself. New, new the shiny new van made the officers suspicious. They wondered if anyone no could have tampered with it. It ain't nothing wrong with they it. They wanted to know exactly nothing. where Davis had gotten the vehicle. I've never seen this vehicle before. Because new, JJ had so completely won Davis's trust, Davis told the cops that he himself had rented the van. Think, man? Is it all right? Yeah. He vouched for it. It's okay. That calmed their fears. I picked it out myself. Okay, this is the importance, guys, of having good undercover agents and informants. When you are uh, so embedded into the criminal organization where your target starts to go ahead and vouch for you as an undercover agent or the informant, that's huge. Because obviously the police now are, are skeptical. Like, bro, what the hell? Like, you, you got this van out of nowhere, brand new? Like, eh, eh. You know, you do realize we're kind of doing some illegal shit here. Like, come on, man. So he's able to say, no, 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 bro. I know this shit is lit. It's going to work, whatever it may be. And why is he saying that? Well, obviously, he wants to continue to get paid, right? These guys were making a fucking killing guarding these drugs. They're making $5,000 a day, guys, okay? Which, once again, just to let you guys know, let's go ahead and look at that inflation calculator, right? 
$5,000, all right, is the equivalent to $9,823 today. So imagine, okay, 10,000, right? 10K, well, $5,000 uh, $5, in 19, uh, five, five times 30, right? And because they, they were doing this shit 24 seven, right? So 5,000 times 30, 150K per month, okay? So 150K per month, damn near $300,000 a month to guard drugs. Crazy, crazy. All right, and they're splitting it amongst all these dirty police officers. What do you think, man? Len Davis didn't want anyone upsetting his flow of payments. I picked it the up. The FBI myself. would soon learn just how ruthlessly right, Davis guarded his interests. After three months of shattered shield, more and more New Orleans cops came under the FBI's investigation. Len Davis and undercover agent JJ met often to discuss drug shipments and payoffs for police protection. Davis made frequent threats. They'll tell you, we run this city. We do whatever we want to do. That's what uh, the dirty cops from Baltimore, the Gun Trace Task Force, also were saying, we run this city. They let me know that very many times. If they feel like they want to shut it down, they'll shut it down. But Davis liked the money. JJ knew that as long as the money flowed, he would never shut the operation down. Davis called the shots for the other officers. He recruited and set the schedules using his cell phone. Of success. So this guy. But he complained oh, about his bill. So JJ offered Davis a new cell phone free of charge. Oh. It was one. Another one. The fucking offers him a phone as well. Gotcha, bitch. Now they can go ahead and wiretap that as well because they know that phone is going to be used for illicit activity. Okay? So that'll be an easy Title III affidavit to write up. Because it's gonna, he's buying him a phone to facilitate the drug trafficking. Mind you guys, a cell phone in 1993 was fucking like a big status symbol. That was a big deal, okay? People weren't running around with cell phones in 1993. They were very difficult to procure. One more way the FBI could record the cops' knowing involvement in drug trafficking. The wires the FBI had planted in the warehouse van were paying off. One night, two guards on the graveyard shift brought prostitutes to the van. These niggas. They got fucking hookers. <laughs> oh, man. L, L, L. <laughs> New Orleans L department. That's what we should call this shit, bro. God e damn. All right. So, but this, let's see. Let's see what the FBI does here. They're able to use this and turn it around and make it into a good thing. The wires picked up everything even the cops' sexual indiscretions. When Jenkins heard this, she immediately phoned JJ. So the agent that's monitoring the wire calls the undercover agent. See what he does here. The situation was a chance to catch the cops off balance. JJ called Davis to complain and to see what they'd get on tape. He told Davis he had checked out the warehouse and found that the cops weren't protecting him. JJ wasn't paying cops to have sex. He ordered Davis to straighten things out. Now, this is really good stuff, because I remember when I had my wiretap, guys, you're listening to the phone real time. You can hear all the crazy shit. So you're able to make things kind of happen based off what you hear, okay? So they hear that, and they're like, all right, Let's add this, like, uh, let's do this audible, make this shit happen so we can stimulate some more potential evidence to occur on the case. So he calls Len and says, yo, your fucking guys are smashing in the, in the fucking car. I saw them. They're not doing their jobs. They're not protecting the dope like they're supposed to. So obviously Len, the head of the operation, what does he do? He drives over there in fury and you guys are going to see what happens. Davis arrived in a fury. His Open henchmen were threatening Open to ruin door. his whole operation. Lynn was upset. Lynn was a businessman through and through. Lynn wanted it to work exactly one way. And he was really upset that I was upset. And uh, he got up. He got up. He came out there and, 
and just kicked everybody out. JJ's call brought Davis down on him hard that night. But the episode triggered deep suspicions among the dirty cops. <laughs> Hooker's just leaving like, oh man. <laughs> Damn it! We didn't get paid! They now felt sure that JJ was the problem and believed they could run the operation better themselves. They discussed ways to kill JJ. Oh, so now they're fucking mad because he snitched them out. They want to kill JJ now. Their plans alarmed Agent Karen Jenkins. When I heard those conversations were they were threatening to do harm to our undercover agent, it sent a chill down my spine. It scared me. Um, before I came to New Orleans, I had worked with JJ in another office, so I knew him personally, and I was very concerned. Despite the threats to his life, JJ was resolute, keeping the cops engaged with plans to further expand the operation. Now, normally, you know, if you get a threat on an undercover agent's life, that's kind of like the case agent and the undercover got to have a discussion and be like, hey, do you still want to go? This is very dangerous, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, at this point, he's invested. He's probably, they've been doing this investigation now for several months. Now it's August almost, or uh, September. So they've been going now for all, the better part of a year, right? And JJ met these, has been, has been going for about four months. He got introduced to them in April and of 93. So, you know, like a trooper, he's like, no, we're going to keep going. You know, I'm not worried. He promised Davis that the largest ship would arrive before Christmas. After that, he would move the deliveries to another part of the city. All the time, JJ had to draw out more evidence on tape without making Davis suspicious. He was very careful. He watched everything. He paid attention to everything I said. There were conversations where we yeah. talked. He's obviously very shaky. Cocaine. He would count the times I used. And he would tell him, Jay, you said cocaine five times. That's crazy. Jay, you said kilos five times. Crazy. So I had to be careful. Guilty conscience. At the same time, Haddon and his team had to defuse another plot they overheard. The cops were threatening to kill the couriers and steal the cocaine. So they got two problems. They got some police officers, because remember, guys, the van is wired. They can hear all their conversations. So, and they can hear the telephone conversations with Len Davis and everything else like that. So not only are they hearing that they want to kill the undercover agent JJ, right? The drug kingpin from Miami. They also want to kill the FBI undercovers that are posing as drug couriers that are bringing the drugs to the warehouse. They want to kill them and steal the drugs. Holy man. Oh shit. Oh, and shit. this is obviously extremely dangerous because you got armed police officers there that you know are corrupt, that you know are already ripping off drug dealers. They're, they don't know that these guys are undercover FBI agents. They could just go and say, hey, kill this fucking dude, take the kilos of coke. We can sell that shit and make way more money. So this is two different fires that the Bureau is dealing with right now simultaneously. Okay, and it's going to get even better here. But wait, there's more. The agents scrambled delivery times and mapped new routes to and from the warehouse to keep the cops off balance. With so many dirty cops, the FBI couldn't make a clean sweep from the outside alone. Agents would need someone powerful in the police force to be a strong ally. Despite the danger of leaks, they decided to seek help from within the New Orleans Police Department. Okay, now this is risky, guys. Anytime you're investigating a corrupt police department or any type of like internal investigation like this, um, you know, involving that agency that you're investigating uh, is always risky. But typically, the highest levels, the chiefs, you know, the second guy in command, sometimes they'll be involved in investigations like this with their internal affairs. October 1994 brought fresh changes to New Orleans in a new police chief, Richard Pennington. So, how do you like our first? Pennington was an outsider from Washington, D.C., hired in the hopes of reforming the Crescent City's crooked police force. The FBI invited the new chief for a meeting. Then Haddon introduced J.J. He informed Pennington that Operation Shattered Shield was uncovering corruption deep in the force that he was about to head. His cooperation would be critical for the success of Operation Shattered Shield. 
On the streets of New Orleans, Davis and Williams were still on active duty, cruising their territory. So, you know, they're still doing their thing. They're still fucking, you know, you know, doing their corrupt police shit that corrupt police do. So you guys are going to see here in a second. Len Davis had a long list of public complaints against him. During their rounds one night that October, Davis and Sammy Williams patrolled the Desire Housing Project. Seeing the pair of cops approach, two youths took flight. Williams chased one teenager down, bludgeoned him, and left him bleeding in the street. So he beat the shot of a kid. At that moment, Kim Groves, the victim's aunt, decided that police had terrorized their neighborhood long enough. That. The next day, Groves, a 32-year-old mother of three. So this woman watches her nephew get his ass whooped by those two cops. It wasn't Len. Len Davis was there, but he didn't actually beat up the kid. It was his partner, um, Williams, that beat him up. Filed a complaint against Len Davis and his partner. So she files a complaint that's going to go directly to who? Internal Affairs, guys. And... Who doesn't want internal affairs involved? Len Davis, because he's got a whole sophisticated drug trafficking or, uh, operation going on that he has a bunch of cops working on. So the last thing he needs is a fucking internal affairs investigation against him. She cited the pair for police violence. An officer alerted Davis about the complaint. You want to know his name? Officer Davis, do you know him? Yeah, this is definitely a Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon saw the report. She reported not only Sammy Williams, who did the actual brutality, but Len Davis as well, who, who had nothing to do with that pistol whipping. And uh, at that point, uh, Len Davis became uh, uh, enraged. For Davis. So he was mad as hell. And this woman knew who Len Davis was. Like everyone in the area knew him. So she reported him and the other guy just because Len Davis was there. Even though he didn't beat the dude's ass, but he was pissed. Grove's complaint came at the worst possible time. It would bring unwanted attention just as the new police chief was coming on board. So that's two different things. We got a new police chief, right? So he can get, get in trouble for this shit. And he's running a drug trafficking operation. So it's like, fuck! That I don't want internal affairs looking at my ass right now. Len Davis vowed to get revenge. Oh shit. The same day that Kim Groves filed her complaint, Richard Pennington was sworn in as New Orleans' new chief of police. That marked the start of Shattered Shield's final phase. The shift from an FBI effort to a partnership with a city desperate to clean house. That very night, Agent Jenkins recorded several conversations that would show just how rotten some of the city's men in blue had become. The first call was cryptic. This shit's about to get crazy. Hours after Pennington was sworn in, Len Davis made a call on his cell phone. He gave an order to an unknown man. I need you to do a 30 for me. The FBI taped the con. He said, I need you to do a 30 for me. Conversation. But because Davis spoke in modified police code, yeah. agents didn't know what it meant. While they attempted to decipher it, agents recorded a second, more disturbing call. This time, the unknown man called Davis. As they spoke, a police dis Mind you, they got his phone wired up, so they hear all this shit. Batcher announced a murder in the Desire Housing Project. The victim's name, Kim Groves. Oh shit. Murder in the project. the news, he cried, Rockabye. It was the triumphant cry of a killer. When he later heard it, the call shocked Assistant U.S. Attorney Mike McMahon. As soon as he- Now, I actually have the recordings here for y'all. Instead of, uh, you know, actually, we'll say, see what the AUSA says, then I'll play it after. Confirm the name of Kim Groves. Davis shut off the radio, and then on the, um, uh, the wiretap conversation uh, uh, over the cell phone, just exulted in a primal scream of delight that indeed Kim Groves uh, 
was dead. God damn. When agents were so viewed the tapes and checked the phone. So mind you guys, remember, they're, the, you know, the FBI, just so you guys know what's going on here, right? Because you guys are probably a little confused. A murder? What the fuck? So while they're, while they're monitoring the phones and everything else like that, keep in mind that they're watching the drug house and they're making sure their undercovers don't get killed, okay? Or get robbed. So that was the FBI's focus at the time because they had a drug investigation going on. But at the same time, they didn't know what Len Davis was planning this hit. And they didn't know what the hell he was saying because he was using coded language to uh, go ahead and set up this murder. So it wasn't after until after the murder happened that they were able to go back to the videotape, decipher what the hell he was saying, and put it together and say, oh shit, this dude ordered a hit, okay? Phone records. They discovered that the man who spoke to Davis was Paul Hardy. So the guy that did the hit was this dude named Paul Hardy. So we're gonna go ahead, guys, and give you guys a little bit of insight as to who Paul Hardy is, okay? Noticed that his friend Len Davis had started to hang around with a violent crack dealer named Paul Hardy. I remember Len having a barbecue at his house. That's when I believed that Len Davis' wires was crossed. And a person would say, well, what do you mean his wires was crossed? It was a little different then. And invited some of us over, and uh, and I went over, and Paul was there. Oh, yeah, gotta call your boy. Oh, PH. Paul Hardy and I, we grew up together. We grew up together in the Cali Projects. We played basketball together, we played, played football together. You know, everybody knew Paul. We were trained. Bred. Got the gold teeth too. Had to be dope dealers, right? When drugs came along, it kind of like, it changes your values, right? There's laws, right? It's that you live by. And if you break those laws, you get executed. It's a normal way of living when you're in the dope game. It was common knowledge, yes, he's a drug dealer. Yes, he's violent. He had been arrested for some various homicides, but he always was able to get off. People were afraid to testify against Hardy. He walked on two homicides, two murders uh, in state court here because of witness intimidation. So here, this dude beat two murders, okay? Mr. Goldteeth over here beat two murders in the state and no one could do shit and no one wanted to testify against him. Everyone was terrified. This guy is Len Davis' right-hand man. But with Davis and Williams by his side, Paul Hardy seemed to be above the law. Len Davis protected Paul Hardy. They were tight. They would ask Len if there was any police protection in the area when they wanted to go shoot up somebody. They had a very close street level relationship. You would not want to wrong Paul Hardy because you'd end up dead. You know, now you're starting to see, you know, Len and Paul together. And again, I didn't really know who, but I heard of his reputation. Him wanting to mix with Len, be around a lot of cops, and Len wanting to mix with him, to me, I thought was like, it was just a little odd, you know, that they became friends like that. So he's talking to him, I'm sure not the police no more. They lost me a long fucking time ago. This is fucking golden evidence right here. Oh shit! Oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I'm on this good strictly to get what I can get. But things were strictly business at FBI headquarters. They had their sights set on what? Then we kind of stood down a little bit. We breathed a sigh of relief and decided, okay, you know, things are okay for now. But more drama was brewing. The day before. Okay, so this is going to illustrate the shooting as well from another perspective, guys. A little bit more detail. Four, 32-year-old local Kim Groves and a relative filed a civil complaint against Sammy Williams and Len Davis for beating their nephew on the street. Kim, at the time, was a mother of three, uh, two daughters and a son. Kim Groves had witnessed the brutality committed by Sammy Williams. Uh, she was in the crowd. A complaint was made to the then Internal Affairs Division of the NOPD, accusing both Sammy Williams and Len Davis, who had nothing to do. He didn't touch the kid, and that infuriated Davis. It's my understanding that her motivation for making the complaint was that she knew that Len Davis was a bad guy. She didn't like him anyway. And because he was there, she used that as an opportunity to make a complaint against him. Yeah. So she didn't like him already, so, and he was there. So she was like, fuck it. Talk to the commander and IED. They get dope, oh, they looking for something to come down. Okay, you know, things are... A complaint was made to Davis. Like him anyway. She talked to the commander IED and he say, he tired of hearing my name and been wanting to get me. So he knows he's going to get in trouble. Lynn Davis was a power figure in the community and you did not complain about Lynn Davis. While they were on patrol, a car with Kim Groves 
pulled on the side of the police unit. It was a marked unit. The fifth guy in the coat, yeah. the nigga that I was telling you about, yeah. and uh, they might have been going up to IED when I saw him because they come. I, they got this right. It's not IED. A, it's probably IAD, Internal Affairs Division. Speeding up on side of us so they can look at us and shit. She pulled up on him, pointing back and forth, and then that caused Davis to call Paul Hardy, the hitman, to say, When it gets up, be looking for something to come down. All of the work, something going to be coming most likely. See, so this is what he told Paul Hardy to do. So the FBI, remember, they're listening to this real time, but they don't know what the hell this means because they're more focused on their drug investigation, not knowing that this dude, Len Davis, is planning a murder for hire, essentially. At the time, we were not aware of it, that this meant go kill her. I was talking about when they get dumped. Back on, Danny. Look, you listen to me. It's faded, it's black jeans uh -huh. with big white bleach stains. Okay. Brown skin with light brown eyes. I got the phone on and the radio. After so, it's done, go straight up town and call me. So he's describing her look. He, he's doing mind simultaneously, guys. So what he's doing is he's at her area looking for her telling the, the hitman what she's wearing okay paul hardy's the hitman so this is crazy shit he's in his police car <laughs> ordering hits on october 13th at 10 50 p.m kim groves was executed on a new orleans street corner what's up so this is after the hit is done okay guys so he goes what's up and he goes shabaka which was probably code word for we did the job and he goes, I know, I'm listening to uh, they code nine in it right now. So the murder comes out on the radio and he's saying they're code nine in it right now, putting it out. That looking like a 30? Looking like a 30. Uh, male, female? 30 is uh, police jargon for murder, guys. Female, right female. You don't have a name, huh? Let's see his reaction after the police dispatcher tells him Kim, Kim Groves. Crazy. Fucking screaming on that bad boy. rock a -bye. <laughs> Oh my god. Heartless. Heartless. So we'll go back to the original documentary here. So uh, your boy, this is your boy Paul Hardy coming up and, you know, laying that thing. Go. Davis had asked Hardy for a 30, a police code normally used to report a homicide. Police code for homicide. But that night, a 30. Davis used it as an order for the murder of Kim Groves. Yeah. Canvassing the projects, agents yeah. quickly learned that Hardy yeah. was a known drug Come on, man, let's go, let's led go, a small... Go. He shot her in the head with a 9mm, which I'll show you guys the indictment here in a second with that document. Uh, which is basically, right here. See, I'm prepared, baby. I got everything ready to go, man. What are the fucking... Dumb, dumb, monko, monko. What other podcast has all this shit? So, this is the indictment that I got, they got him for, for a violation of conspiracy against civil rights guys, Len Davis, Paul Hardy, and then the third conspirator, Damon Cowsey, okay? Uh, on October 13, 1994, in the Eastern District of Louisiana, defendant Len Davis, who was then employed as an officer with the New Orleans Police Department, and defense Paul Hardy, a.k.a. P. and Damon Cowsey, did will, will, uh, willfully combine, conspire, and agree with each other and with, other person, with others known and unknown to the grand jury to inj injure, oppress, threaten, and intimidate Kim Mary Groves, a person in the state of Louisiana, in the free exercise and enjoyment of the rights and privileges secured to her by the Constitution and laws of the United States, which include, one, the right to not be deprived of liberty without due process of law, that is, the right to be free from the use of unreasonable force by one acting under color of law, and that defendants Len Davis, Paul Hardy, and Damon Cowsey were uh, acting under color of laws of the state of Louisiana at all times relevant to this indictment. Sheesh! <laughs> all right? Because he was a police officer doing this shit, okay? So here are the overt acts before I, you know, I keep going into this thing. Basically, after learning that Kim Marie Groves had filed civil uh, rights complaint against him, defendant Len Davis contacted defendant Paul Hardy, a.k.a. P, on several occasions on or about October 13, 1994, to arrange the murder of Kim Marie Groves. On or about October 13, 1994, defendant Len Davis contacted defendant Damon Cowsey to arrange a meeting whereby defendant Len Davis would identify Kim Marie Groves to the defendant's Paul Hardy and Damon Cowsey. See, that's when he was describing her, remember, with the, with the pants and everything else like that thereby facilitating the murder of Kim Marie Groves, okay? Uh, on or about October 13, 1904, defendant Len Davis, while on duty and while using his official police car, conducted surveillance on of Kim Marie Groves 
for the purpose of reporting Grove's physical description and location to the defendant, Paul Hardy, a.k.a. P. Okay, so let's go back to the documentary here real fast. With the help of two accomplices, Hardy acted quick, cold, and for just $300. 300 bucks. As he sped away over a bridge, Hardy threw the barrel of the gun into the canal. All right, why did he throw the barrel of the gun into the canal? The reason why he did that, guys, is because when you shoot a firearm, okay, it gives you a, it gives the bullet fragments a certain, uh, how do I say this, distinct pattern, okay? Think of it as like a fingerprint. So when a fire, or when a bullet is fired outside of a firearm, that firearm creates a distinct uh, pattern on that bullet, okay? So that you can identify if the shot fired came from that firearm. So if he gets rid of the barrel, they won't be able to, you know, fully identify if that was the gun that was used in the murder. It makes it dip more difficult. Can you still identify if that gun was the murder weapon? Absolutely. But it does make it a little bit harder uh, for forensic analysts to do so, which is why he threw it out side of the window. I mean, he should have just threw the whole fucking gun out there, but, you know, you know, stupid criminal's gonna do stupid shit, right? So, stupid. And handed the body of the gun to an accomplice for safekeeping. And that accomplice we know is Damon, uh, is, uh, what's it called? What's his name again? It's, uh, uh, fuck, what was that guy's name? Damon Cowsey is the, uh, associate. What's up, man? When the FBI realized Davis's role in the murder, agents grew more concerned for JJ's safety. JJ met with Davis soon afterward. He looked carefully for signs that Davis was anxious or upset. Yeah, what's up, he saw man? none. So the FBI figures out after the fact that he was involved in ordering a hit. So they go and meet up with him and try to see his demeanor after. The murder of Kim Groves seemed to have relaxed Davis. Yeah. Look, let me call you back JJ later, right? still had to play his part, the role of a drug lord. Though uneasy, he was careful not to talk about the murder. I wanted to ask a lot of questions about it. I couldn't. The only thing I'd ask him was, is there anything different happening since the last time I was here? He said no. And we went on just like nothing ever happened. Is he a cold-blooded killer? I could probably do you in a minute, yeah. Having seen what Davis and his cops could do, JJ had every reason to believe that he could be next. He was unaware that they were already planning ways to kill him. Days after Len Davis ordered the murder of Kim Groves, the FBI learned of more threats by Davis's men. So shit's getting crazy now. A New Orleans police officer assisting in Operation Shattered Shield received an anonymous threat. So they had an officer helping them out on this investigation, and uh, he gets a threatening note. This is what happens when you tell on your own and what do they do it came with kim grove's obituary holy shit <laughs> more evidence the message was clear death would come to those who talked that day stan hadden learned of still more threats against jj and the other agents Agent Jenkins had recorded five cops at the warehouse plotting to kill the couriers and JJ. Then they would steal the cocaine and sell it themselves. Haddon had no choice. The FBI had to wrap up the operation before it was too late. Uh, once we realized that uh, the lives of our undercover agents were at serious risk, uh, then we had to react to it. We had to do something. The FBI needed to move up their plans for the big shipment J.J. had promised to Davis. A cocaine shipment so large that it would require a half dozen more cops to guard it. But Haddon needed a location unfamiliar to the cops, a place where the FBI could mobilize quickly. So they're going to set up, they're setting up the takedown now. He and his team scouted the Mardi Gras truck stop on Elysian Fields Avenue. The spot had good highway access. 
It also posed little risk to the public in the event of a shootout. The cocaine would arrive on an 18-wheeler, then be loaded into cars and escorted by the cops out of the city. Every detail had to be mapped out. Yeah, doing an operation like this is fucking crazy, man. The plan would require the coordination of 85 agents positioned strategically along the routes. 85 agents, man. This is what it takes to do these kinds of big investigations, guys. I've done cases like this, man. It is a nightmare, you know, because you're doing massive surveillance. And on this case, they're, you know, surveilling dirty police officers, okay? Because the police officers are supposed to be watching the drugs, and the agents are watching the dirty officers watching the drugs. So it is fucking a crazy effort, man. When Davis put out the word about a huge November 18th shipment, he enticed new recruits. As a load of cocaine worth a quarter of a million dollars arrived, Davis, Williams, and their crew stood ready as protection. Agents posing as drivers moved the shipment. From the command center, Haddon and Jenkins kept watch of the whole operation. There were hundreds. So a command center, guys, is typically uh, when you have a big operation where you have so many moving parts, where you know you got undercover agents, you got surveillance units, you got air units, whatever assets you may have. You have a command center, and for, in the command center, typically is the case agent, the co-case agent, the supervisor, uh, people that are uh, you know intimately involved with the investigation that understand the facts of the case, and they're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones on the radios. Hey, I need you to follow this guy. I need you to follow this guy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, because since they know the facts and circumstances of the case, they tell all the other agents who don't know the case, right, what they need to do. Okay, because. Um, they're the ones directing the case and also sometimes the US Attorney is on board uh, also at the command center seeing what the hell's going on because they're the ones that are gonna be prosecuting it so they're gonna be also be involved to see what the hell's going on because at the end of the day uh, the prosecutor needs all the facts to build an uh, uh, effective case against the criminals okay so that's what a command center is of ways the truck stop scenario could go wrong with the undercover agents lives on the line there was no margin for error Cocaine was divided in two loads. Williams escorted one. Davis followed the other. They shepherded the couriers to the edge of town, shielding them from other drug gangs and from the law. To make it easier for our surveillance, we had one of the uh, courier cars go to the east and one go to the west because we had two complete surveillance teams operating simultaneously and we didn't want the two to get crossed up with each other. Smart. So you separate it. The operation went off without a hitch. Six additional cops were videotaped in the act of drug trafficking. The FBI was about to enter the last phase of Shattered Shield. Which that's huge. That's great evidence. You know what I'm saying? You're able to basically identify these other officers that are basically transporting drugs arresting the corrupt cops who would kill anyone who opposed them. After the big truck stop operation, FBI agents moved quickly on the murder of Kim Groves. They searched the house of the hitman, Paul Hardy. So they go ahead and search Paul Hardy's house, right? And look at what they find. Actually, you know what? I'll go ahead and play the video first, and then, we'll, uh, and then I'll read the document for y'all. There, agents found an unauthorized copy of a guide to police codes. Oh, shit. Why is the drug trafficker that beat two murder cases walking around with a, uh, an unauthorized copy of police codes not openly available to the public? Where did he get that? You know? That is the real question here. Where did he get that? The same codes that Davis used when he ordered Grove's murder. Another search at the home of one of Hardy's accomplices. So they did another search. The murder weapon, oh. a nine millimeter handgun. Bam! They find the gun at one of uh, Hardy's boys' house, which is where, right here in the indictment, on or about October 13th at the 10:01 p.m., defendant Len Davis ordered defendant Paul Hardy to get that whore, thereby ordering the murder of Kim Mary Groves. Defendant Paul Hardy 
uh, agreed to kill uh, Kim Mary Groves and stayed in response. All right, I'm on my way. On or about October 13, 1994, at 10.55 p.m., defendant Paul Hardy, a.k.a. P, shot Kim Groves in the head with a 9 millimeter firearm, which resulted in her death. Defendant Damon Cowsey did conceal the 9 millimeter firearm used to kill Kim Marie Groves by hiding the firearm in a chest of a drawer of drawer of drawers in his bedroom located at 3930 Florida Avenue, apartment B, New Orleans, Louisiana. You know what? Just for fun, let's go ahead and look this bad boy up. The, where, 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 did, where did the FBI exactly find this thing? So we're going to go ahead and use our friend Google Maps, okay? And the address is 39. I know you guys really enjoy this stuff, so let's type in <laughs> this address to see where the hell it's at, actually at. Uh, okay. 3930 uh, Florida Avenue. Bam. The fuck? Okay, let me just fucking let me go back. All right. Bear with me here, guys. Sorry. 3930 Florida. Avenue, New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay. Oh, yeah, it's the hood. <laughs> okay, so they, they might have knocked it over. But this is, this, is, uh, this is what it is now. As of 2014, this is probably it right here. Oh, shit. Doesn't look too friendly. Yeah, that's, it looks like it right there. He is in the trap. All right. Uh, my bad. Okay, let's go back to it. The two investigations, Shattered Shield and the murder, were closing at the same time. So they basically put off the, the corruption case a little bit so that they can go ahead and solve the murder as well, guys. And they detail this uh, here. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was home on a Saturday. I got a call from federal prosecutors who- Kim Groves was murdered after filing a civil complaint against- him. The undercover operation going so that we could perhaps convict all of the officers that were involved. The FBI believed they had recorded evidence of Davis ordering Paul Hardy to kill Groves one night during a 10 month sting operation into police corruption at the NOPD. We already had all the evidence we needed to try and convict all of the officers that were involved in guarding the warehouse. But management wanted to keep the undercover operation going so that we could perhaps get additional incriminating information about the actual murder of Kim Groves. And that was a smart move. But the feds needed a murder weapon to indisputably tie Davis to the crime. Two weeks later, on November 2nd, 1994, while searching the home of one of Hardy's right-hand men, the FBI looked- Well, we know who he is. His name is Damon Cowsey, right? Because we actually got the court documents right here. This fucking clown. They searched Damon Cowsey's house, and we know it was at 3930 Florida Avenue. Located what they were looking for. We found what proved to be the weapon that was actually used in the murder of Kim Gross. Bam, there you go, guys. They fucking got it right there, my friends. Gotcha, bitch! After nearly a year of investigations and hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxpayer money, Len Davis and Paul Hardy were arrested and charged with murder. So they arrested them first for the murder. I learned of the murder. And Damon Cowsey. So three, there were three conspirators in that. So now this dirty cop, right, Dees, who was also involved in this protecting the drugs, he's also involved. So let, let's uh, get his perspective on what happened. Of Kim Groves when everybody else did. Another police officer said something about, hey, Dees, do you, did you hear what happened? I said, no, what happened? He said the feds had just arrested Lynn Davis for conspiracy to commit murder and that more was going to come out on the 12 o'clock news. And I'm calling Lynn on that cell phone and then the phone just kept going to voicemail so he's fucking terrified he finds out that the guy that recruited him to do this drug protection just got arrested for murder so he's like oh shit and paul hardy as well and he knows paul hardy remember he was at the barbecue so he knew who this fucking mur drug trafficking uh murderer was right and obviously len davis is his friend so he's going nuts because he's trying to call len on the cell phone that they used to do the you know the drug conspiracy and he's not answering. So it's like, oh, fuck. And then the news is going to come out on the news. So his fucking butthole is like, uh, <laughs> oh, Lord. And uh, I got very nervous. 
At the same time, I'm getting paged from the 5th District Police Station. Oh, shit. So now the 5th District is calling him as well. And, and guys, for some of you young boys out there, you might not know what a page is. This is back when beepers were a thing, okay? This is 1994 at this point. You know, they didn't have cell phones like that. They had beepers. Of course, he had a cell phone because he was a drug trafficker, but the PD didn't have that kind of money. So they were just using a, a beeper with his ass. So then I called the police station, and that's when they told me that I was due for a meeting at the police station. Oh, shit. I get there, as soon as I turned in to, to go into the room, all I see is all the other guys standing there, all of them are handcuffed. And the federal agent tells me, Adam Dees, uh, you've been indicted for conspiracy. You know, you're under arrest. Bam. They say that I was, you know, engaged in a conversation about killing federal agents. And to this day, 25 years later, uh, that's just not true. It just, it just, it just not true. Critics say even by New Orleans standards, the latest police scandal is shocking. Nine officers behind bars indicted on federal drug charges. Adam Dees and eight other officers were indicted on charges of conspiracy to distribute cocaine and the use of firearms while drug trafficking. From when they arrested- Bam, and these are all the officers, you know, uh, that were arrested. Damn, shit crazy. Uh, so we'll go back to the original documentary. Believe his face. Believe his face. So they arrest Len Davis. For Davis's partner, Sammy Williams. And then they also get his partner, Sammy Williams. Agents would use a different approach. Haddon wanted to flip Williams to the prosecution side. When you flip someone, guys, you t basically turn him into an informant or a cooperator with the government. So he wants to flip him against who? Len Davis, who is the main mastermind behind this drug, tra uh, uh, drug conspiracy. At that point? It worked. And they decided, okay, let's... Uh... You guys are going to see why it worked here in a second. Imagine being, da uh, you know, this, um, not Davis, um, Williams, after you just got arrested for corruption and then this shit happens to you. Throw another curveball and then it says bring Juan in. So they brought me into the door and I introduced myself, especially to Juan Jackson, the FBI. You can see the, the color leave his face. <laughs> his gotcha, came bitch. Back to Sammy Williams turned government witness. His testimony would later prove crucial for getting convictions. Hadden and his Sammy is not the one that did the hit, guys. Len Davis was the one that did the hit. Don't forget, Samuel Williams was just his partner. Team had no time to lose. Before news of Davis and Williams' arrests could spread, they had to deliver the rest of the gang to justice. Dozens of armed men in uniform. The strategy we were to employ was to arrest Lynn Davis on December the 5th. And then uh, on December the 6th, we had all of these officers appear before a federal grand jury. And then on December 7th, the grand jury ordered all these officers to come to the FBI office to give handwriting exemplars. So this is a little bit of a discrepancy here because on one side they're saying some of them got arrested at the 5th district and then some of them are getting arrested here at the FBI office. So they probably did two different operations here uh, where some of them came to the to the FBI office to provide handwriting exemplars so they wouldn't suspect anything and then the other portion would uh, you know, show up at the 5th district. Len Davis's recruits arrived at the FBI's office to give handwriting samples for analysis together with 60 fellow officers. And not all 60 were obviously corrupt, so they made it so that way they wouldn't suspect anything. They just asked a whole bunch of them and they put the cro uh, crooked ones in that 60. Since the drug ring involved no written records and so many officers provided writing samples, the crooked cops suspected nothing. Like the others before it, the FBI's ruse worked. One by one, more than a dozen dirty cops of New Orleans were arrested. That, that was a safe way to do it because obviously all of these officers were armed and they were facing very serious charges and, and that was a way to do it to avoid any potential for uh, any bloodshed or any uh, unwanted uh, um, uh, resistance by the officers. 
In court, the FBI's recordings build a solid case against the officers. Are you aware we have hours and the videos and audio tapes spoke louder than the code words and erased all doubts that jurors might have had. So let's go ahead and talk about the trial because Len Davis actually ended up taking this to trial, guys. The murder he took to trial. I think he pled guilty to the drug charges. But let's go ahead and talk about the trial. Arrested me. You know, life changes. I knew it for these and eight other. And where's uh? Here's your boy Samuel Williams right here. By the way, this is the guy that ended up cooperating uh, with the government against Len Davis, the main guy. Officers were indicted on charges of conspiracy to distribute cocaine and the use of firearms while drug trafficking. From when they arrested me, you know, life changes. I knew it forever. You know, I went from, you know, putting handcuffs on people to having the handcuffs put on me. Dees was held in jail for two years awaiting his trial before pleading guilty and accepting a deal off. And there's the indictment right here. Well, actually, this is a, uh, is this an information here? Uh, uh, commission of a drug, yeah, misprison of felony and use of a communication facility and the commission of a drug felony. Yeah, so basically that's using a phone. Uh, yeah, su second superseding bill of information. Okay, so it's not an indictment, it's information. Information, guys, is basically uh, when the prosecutor themselves issues a charging, uh, it's a formal charge done by the prosecutor, so. For by prosecutors. So they gave me an 84 month sentence, you know, and I served five years and 10 months. But there was no plea deal for fellow officer Len Davis. In April 1996, Davis went to trial for the murder of Kim Groves. And what do I always tell you guys when you go to trial, if you lose, it's not going to be a good look for you. So he pled guilty to the drug stuff, but he didn't want, he fought the murder charge, okay? Which I showed you guys the indictment. This is what they were getting him with here. Okay, this is what he was indicted for. Um, 18 USC 241, okay, violation of a conspiracy against civil rights, right, which led to murder. And uh, matter of fact, here you guys go. This is his actual case docket right here. Yo, like the goddamn video. Well, no, sorry, we're not on YouTube. Never mind. <laughs> but make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel, Fed1811, because I ain't nobody going to have all this information for you guys. So this is what they actually charge them with. Violation of civil rights, violation of civil rights, and aiding and abetting, right? And then uh, violation of uh, civil rights of conspiracy against civil rights, murder, right? So he ended up getting uh, these all dismissed, okay? But he ended up getting convicted of these two, all right? Uh, and let's see here. And then you got Richard Reeves. These are all the other um, cases that were involved in this situation. So he goes to trial, right? I have recordings that we played at trial of conversations between Lynn Davis and Paul Hardy, the hitman, when Lynn told Paul Hardy... And this is one of the U.S. attorneys uh, as well. Uh, yeah, guys, it's quick little break here. Do me a favor. Go ahead and subscribe to my YouTube channel, uh, Feta1811 on there. I'm going to re-upload this video uh, on there. So uh, check me out over there, man. You know what I want to do. I'm talking about when they get built. they looking for something to come down. He also complained about being a cop. Complained that uh, nobody appreciated the cops anymore. The the so they're playing this all at trial, guys. So this makes Len look really bad. Playing all this shit in trial. The last words that the jury heard out of Len Davis's mouth were Oh shit. Fucking mic drop. <laughs> Fucking mic drop. That's in our case. <laughs> On April 26th, 1996, Len Davis was convicted of directing Paul Hardy to murder Kim Groves, as well as witness tampering. And the jury recommended the death sentence. On the day of Kim Grove's murder, a new police superintendent was sworn in. Within months, Richard Pennington announced new policies to stamp out corruption in the department. The public will be protected from bad cops. Our presence will be felt by citizens and criminals. The Shattered Shield prosecution was the most significant case handled by the Department of Justice in memory in, in New Orleans. It prompted reforms in the department. The politicians we're not going to do on their own. In the past three years, more than 100 police officers have been suspended, fired, arrested, or convicted of a wide variety of serious crimes, ranging from bribery to murder. What do we want? 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 There's still corruption. Even after the Davis case, uh, cops have been prosecuted again for corrupt activities. But I certainly uh, pray that we'll never have a case as uh, terrible uh, as Shattered Shield. Yeah, that was crazy shit, man. Uh... Agent Karen Jenkins knew the evidence was strong. He was a, a poor uh, uh, cop and didn't have a lot of training, but he was trying oh, to... Oh, yeah, so this a, is... It, a poor... So here's his defense, guys. When he was at trial, this is what Len Davis tried to say at trial before he got convicted. 
What the officers said, they were able to see for themselves what they were doing because of the videos that we had. That wasn't me, it could have been anybody. As Prosecutor Al Winters had predicted early in the investigation, Davis tried to talk his way out of it. All police officers know what that is. It's a homicide. Even after all the safeguards we took, Davis's defense at the trial was that he was conducting his own undercover operation, that uh, it was not really done according to the book, but, you know, he was a, a poor uh, uh, cop and didn't have a lot of training, but he was trying to conduct his own undercover operation. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, fucking L, man. <laughs> Davis never admitted any wrongdoing. He didn't need to. The audio and videotape spoke for themselves. Faced with the prospect of convicting those sworn to protect them, the citizens of the jury listened intently. The tapes were were chilling and as those tapes that's the same bald prosecutor from before if you guys notice tapes were played uh, uh the courtroom was as silent as as a cathedral has the jury reached a verdict yes your honor we have will the defendant please stand the jury deliberated just 15 minutes 15 we minutes the jury find the defendant guilty of murder in the first degree and hereby sentence the Len Davis was sentenced to death for his role in Kim Grove's murder. God which was later commuted to life. I think he's still actually, guys. I think he's still on uh, death uh, uh, death row because here he is, right here, guys, at U.S. Bureau of Prisons. Okay, this is how you look up an inmate, by the way. Go on uh, usbop.gov. You can put their name in. Here we go. Boom. Len Davis, blackmail. Here he is, right here. Uh, he's at the USP Terry Hot. I think this is Indiana or Illinois, and you guys can see right there that sentence still. Paul Hardy though ended up getting um, a life in prison because because uh, they said that he had mental instabilities. Yeah, Indiana, bam. So that's where he is right now, guys, being held, which is a high security U.S. penitentiary. So crazy, crazy stuff. In two other trials, Davis and his co-conspirators received 18 convictions for drug trafficking. Fifteen officers were headed for prison. Because he cooperated with prosecutors, Sammy Williams was sentenced to just five years. He would never again wear a badge. You have irrevocably stained that uniform you once wore. But I must reluctantly recognize that other crimes can only be solved with cooperation of people like you. Court dismissed. He got way less time. For the big easy, other guy. Adam's case brought a long, hard look in the mirror. Bam. So there you go, guys. That is Operation Shattered Shield, my friends. Uh, really fucking good stuff right there. Uh, fucking. Down the Monko, Monko. Uh. If you guys really, you guys want me to do more cases like that where I break down um, documentaries, because I could do it. It's just that, as you guys could see, it's like fucking crazy shit because it's like, you know, with the copyright and everything else like that. Um, the FBI file documentaries are really good, um, but I don't know, man. I might have to do them like somewhere else because YouTube is, is having issues with that shit. So I might have to do it where I do a part of it on YouTube, and then you guys got to come on over to Patreon or some shit. But, uh, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed that bad boy. Um, Cool. So I'm going to find a way to get this thing up on YouTube for y'all. But that, man, I hope you guys enjoyed the stream. Uh, and yeah, catch us tomorrow for Money Monday. Love you guys. Uh, Jay, you got anything you want to say to people? Final thoughts or anything like that? <laughs> really? I don't know. I'll just give you a final <laughs> no. word here. Um, no. It was, it was interesting. Um, it's crazy to think about the people that are supposed to protect and uh, serve the community doing something so outlandish yeah you crazy know shit. when you're supposed to feel safe but yeah yeah it's wild uh yeah guys and for some of you guys that are wondering she's italian i know some of you guys were like what, what's her i am a little bit persian though too oh you are saying that you mean, yeah. you mean iranian persian doesn't exist anymore <laughs> <laughs> uh but anyway guys yo we'll catch you guys uh tomorrow for money monday man love y'all uh and yeah i'll figure out this situation with youtube and fi and i'll find a way to do these breakdowns with you guys i know you guys really enjoyed this bad boy so i'll catch you guys later peace